Hello, and welcome to 10 Very Big Books, a Malazan read-through podcast. My name is Peter Bond. I've read every book in the main series. However, my co-hosts are reading the series for the first time. With me today is my friend and closest confidant, India Jones. Hi. Uh, and our producer, AJ Faleri. How are the levels? They're better than they were about a minute ago. <laughs> <laughs> and the nine-foot-tall, face-tattooed, wood-sword-wheeling, mass-murdering madman of our podcast, Joshua Dean Baker. What's up? <laughs> I don't have anything funny to say about that. That's just who I am. <laughs> it's just a fact. Thank you, Bashar, for that name. Now, I gotta say, you know, we finished Memories of Ice, and I would say, although I really had no idea how that conversation was gonna go, I think I had a good impression of the gist of it, just because, I, like, I, the Memories of Ice finale is so strong, and it's such a certain type of traditional finale in a way. And that brings us to this episode, which I, you know, we all finished reading the book this last week, and I have absolutely no idea how the three of you are going to feel about this book and it's particularly weird ending so I'm very much looking forward to discussing it you know I have no idea where this conversation is going to take us yeah hmm. so <laughs> I guess with let's that said <laughs> let's start chapter 23 Magoro cooks for both Absalar and Cutter. Together, the pair speak about Kalam and Cotillion. Absalar thinks Cotillion wants to use all three of them, but is hesitant about Absalar since she has many of his memories and knows the mortal man, Dancer. Cutter asks where they will go, and he has a feeling Absalar knows. Troll and Onrak will travel with the other Talani mass through the Talan Warren. Through tundra and jungle, they will journey all the way to the first throne to defend it from Tist Eater and renegade Talani mass. They journey into the Warren together and speak about their mission. And Troll struggles to make the same journey the I mass do. Troll also alludes to his past and the story of his shorning. He doubts if there's anything to be learned from it, and says he will tell them when they are waiting at the first throne. Pearl and Lestara are within Raruku. The whirlwind goddess has withdrawn her power, and they can see the toll she has taken on the land. They speak more then about the Talon, the rebellion, and their attraction to one another. Lestara then knocks Pearl out with a distraction. She briefly spots the Ashok Regiment, and then speaks with Cotillion. They speak more about other tasks, and Cotillion lets her keep an object. Absalar faces the desert, and meets with Cotillion. Together they speak of Cutter and his love for Absalar. Cotillion wants to use the boy in a way. They speak about Absalar's power and her restraint. Cotillion speaks to her of an all-encompassing love, a love of multitudes. Absalar decides to help Cotillion in Cutter's place. Cotillion leaves and soon after Absalar. Kalam is hidden amongst petrified trees. He reflects on his otatural knife and senses some foreign power in the forest. Kalam has an acorn. Troll and Onrak travel together into a warm jungle. They speak about the Imas's past and where they lived. The Imas's people's ancestors were the Eris. The Eris were a more primitive people, but amongst the first to be aware. They had holy sites that burned through the Warren of Talon. They used this gate and in it. An heiress woman takes Troll's seed, leaving him with cuts on his stomach and blood on his lap. Through the gateway, though, they are greeted by Apt and the boy Panic. Panic is defending the first throne and says he will lead them to the others.
Okay, Josh, this chapter starts and Absalar and Cutter are catching up with Mogoro. I don't know how to say her name, Mogoro. And um, they're just. She's having fun spider times and they talk about their imminent journey and then they talk a little bit more about Cutter being used as opposed to Absalar. So talk about the ending too if you would like, but how did you ultimately feel about where Cutter and Absalar have been brought to at this point and this type of conversation about Cotillion and then later. They speak more directly to Cotillion. I, I think I've not loved their journey so far this series. You know, it's not been like my, it's not really stood out to me in a lot of ways. However, I think this book, um, I really enjoy, uh, I enjoy that they are more equal partners in this book than they have been in previous ones. You know what I mean? Like in mm-hmm. their, in their traveling time, like Cutter is able to take care of himself so much better than he was in the previous books. So I appreciated that. Going towards the end, as you said, I could talk about that a little bit. I really love, love the, that our, their paths are divergent. I think that's exactly what their characters need uh and by that i mean that's what cutter needs because he needs to just stop like following absolar around like a little lost dog interesting but yeah uh i don't know i, I enjoyed it i i always enjoy the cotillion scenes i think he's a very fun character and is much more light-hearted than the other gods that we get to talk to or ascendants well i don't know if i'd call him light-hearted but let's leave that ending there for now because i think we have a lot mm-hmm. of opportunities to talk about these two characters and yeah this and i think the next chapter are still kind of building in a way they're kind of linking mm-hmm. us towards the finale. And that brings us to uh, Troll and Onrak, who in this chapter, let's talk about both parts of their journey together. They decide to travel to the first throne through the Talan Warren. They speak about their pasts a little bit. And we also learn about the heiress and they go through an heiress holy site and then kind of one of them uh, assaults and like cuts open. There's a there's a thing with troll. So AJ, where did you come at with this journey? And was this something you were really expecting in the book? I'm not sure what you mean. Was I expecting it? Because no, I was not expecting a new type of uh, <laughs> elf adjacent person and another Delaney Mass to have an adventure together when I started reading this book. If that's what you're asking, sure. Um, <laughs> I guess I guess here. Let me speak about my feeling. I feel like even though um, I, I I read this book before, this is just still. It feels like it really comes out of left field in a way. You know, just all hmm. of a sudden we're in the Talon Warren, and then there's this era and you know you know it really it really snuck up on me and i wonder if you feel that way as well yeah i mean i think a lot of the stuff that happens in the troll on rack sections is kind of unpredictable because it is so isolated from the rest of the events of the book Mm. so like no matter what they did you know it's not really related to anything else that anybody else is doing Mm. uh until really the end of this chapter when when they when they get to the first uh, the first throne and meet panic and apt outside and then we have some connection to you know calam and stuff but like outside of that it was just kind of they were doing their own thing they were chilling they were being bros i was really loving it um so like i think for their own story i don't know i think this kind of tracks of them you know this seems like a logical conclusion but in the terms of the rest of the book there was no way this you know there was no way when i first met troll and Unrack that i was going to predict this is where they would end up and, and this is really i mean we're going to touch on them at the very end of this book of course but i believe this is our last time really seeing them until the yeah. epilogue mm-hmm. yeah. because really we, they kind of get to the first throne and then we spend most of our time in raraku um right. so that brings me um oh i want to i just want to hop in here real quick Get in there. Uh, can I just say, uh, I want to say, when it comes to reading these books, uh, you were talking about how to, how to, how do you feel about things coming out of left field? I have a shoe to baseball diamond when it comes to this book and all these books, and I live in a sphere of left fields, and it really. <laughs> Just when I read these books, I assume at any point that he could be like, and then yes, Josh, this happened. Like anything <laughs> Directly he to could you. say, yeah, he could start speaking <laughs> to me, and he could be like, now your cat's gonna get on your lap, and it did, and it would, and I'd be like, yep, that's how this book do. You're no longer playing baseball; you're playing blaze ball. Oh yeah, blog. <laughs> She's really fucking in on this blaze ball thing. Okay, okay. <laughs> So wait, it, really quick. Sorry, 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 sorry. Because uh, I, I wanted to talk about my feelings about that section, if that's okay. Oh, please. Because you know, you know, I have feelings about trolling on rack. I love them so much. They're my favorite two sons. Um, 
And uh, I just thought it was really neat to hear a b- more about Trolls uh, Shorning, hmm. you know, and how basically he was forced to, like, stop existing. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. Even even in his head to be like, yeah, no, I was never, you know, I was never a uh, eater. I'm just kind of I'm just kind of a dude. Uh, and then the, the juxtaposition of that compared to the Talane mass, like breaking of the vow. Yeah, how it's like they are forced to remember this person or, or this, you know, being that is that is broken their vow or whatever. Uh, and I thought it was really interesting when Charles said much of my knowledge did not come to me until much later uh, and on rack, on rack response following your shorning. Uh, and yeah. then he thinks to himself like, yeah, I also didn't learn a lot until I was free from the vow uh, of of my people. Um, which I just thought was really interesting. Uh, and because then it goes on and Monarch uh, has like no feelings about it. And he's like, well, yeah, you know, it just kind of happens. And Onrak's like, well, I mean, <laughs> I it doesn't have to happen. I think you're touching on an interesting parallel between them where they're both characters who have a relationship to their race that mm-hmm. is important to their interpersonal life and that they're mm-hmm. like, like kind of being defined against their race in some sort of way or in the absence of it a way. So, Inge, how do you feel about Troll and Onrak now that their journey to the first throne, they come and finally they meet Panic and Apt. We get to see them again. But really, um, this is kind of the end of their journey of this book. So where did you end up about the two of them throughout the entirety of House of Chains? I was really happy for it to end. They are the most boring characters I've ever read. They speak in a way you that I can't understand. <laughs> Literally, when they, when I'm reading their parts, I'm just like, I have no idea what's happening. I have no idea what they're talking about. They're always talking about something that happened like 10,000 years ago. And I'm just trying to find the relevance. Yeah. I hate them. I mean... I mean, they're good characters. Don't get me wrong. They're like great and sensitive and emotional. And it's like, yeah, but also you are so boring. And I was so happy. The only good thing that came out of that part was that I got to see or read Apt and Panic. (laughs) They're back. They're back. I mean, I do know what you mean, Inge. Pretty much at every moment, Troll turns to Onrak and is like, (laughs) I don't think you can learn anything. And then Onrak's like, no, you can learn from experience. And this continues for like a page and a half. <laughs> and then they move on to... <laughs> and then we're introduced to a new, a new race. <laughs> yeah. I don't get it. He's like, I have no soul, but I have all of these feelings. <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> um, and that's where I stand with them. I, I truly, it was so boring and I say it all the time when I'm reading their parts. It is the reason that I procrastinate reading so much. It is so freaking boring. That's um, all I got to say. Well, let's leave them until the epilogue and tune back in to the main show of the end of House of Change, which is what everything's going to happen in Raruku. So, Inge, you may not be tuned into Troll and Onrak, but how did you feel about Pearl and Lestara as they sneak closer? Lestara knocks out Pearl and then he, she kind of comes up with the whole game plan with Cotillion and then Cotillion kind of gives her this thing and Cotillion goes off to do his, all of his other stuff. So, um, ha- Cotillion has like so many moving pieces I yes. feel, and I'm so intrigued to figure out what is going on because I obviously still haven't. I don't know if you guys have, but in the last, like, re- I guess, I don't know, chapters, whatever, when we were reading it last time, I was like, I really hope that Pearl doesn't like double cross Lestara mm. in some way. And then Lestara <laughs> did, did it to Pearl. So. I don't understand why she knocked him out. I don't know what he was going to do to the plan. I really, that was way over my head. All he wanted to do was see what was in her little pouch. I don't really know what was in her pouch. Do you guys know what was in her pouch? I, I, I just got to say, Pearl wears the pants in a relationship, you know? Not to reduce everything down to that, but, you know. Pearl wears the pants? Sorry. I'm, uh, mm. Yeah, that's what I was like. Uh, uh, I, 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 really? I, I said it all pants wrong. Are. Let me, let me. I just got to say, Lestara wears the pants in this relationship. Not to reduce it down to that simple thing, but, you know. It's correct, though. Yeah. I love that she not only knocked him out, but then threw him over her shoulder. (laughs) Oh, yes. (laughs) He's just kind of a delicate boy, you know. (laughs) Um, Yeah, I think I really like I don't I have no idea, though. Even still reading that, like I, I like them. So that's. Great, but I still don't even know what they're doing or, or what their plan is or what she's doing. So, well, I don't, I don't think any of us did at that point. 
It's it's that I classic. I still don't. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, it's, it's it's all this. I feel like this is one of those run up chapters. Steve writes that's just like the beat's about yeah. to drop. Do you know what I mean? yeah. 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 And this is happening. And this is happening. And this is happening. So, uh, Josh, then uh, we we talked about me and you talked about a bit of this beginning, but then Absalar has her conversation with Cotillion, and it's like a much more uh, heavy one. And then she decides to kind of leave. So, how did you feel about her decision and why she chose it? I was. Very very confused, if I'm being honest, because I like whenever I read Absalar and Cutter chapters, I'm always like, maybe they just like decide they like each other and go not murder people for a living. That'd be cool. They're both kids. They, sure. they need this. But I never expect that to happen because Absalar, like everything she does is basically do is basically saying, hey, Cutter, I don't love you. Go away. <laughs> and then and to Cotillion, she's like. But my biggest secret is I love him. And I, I was I, I I didn't know how to feel about it because I felt it was very abrupt. You know what I mean? Hmm. Like even in the last couple chapters together, she's so distant from him that I was like, I, I, I didn't expect the I almost I almost want to say the cliche. I only act like I hate him because it's too hard to love him. Like I did not expect that from Absalar. AJ looks like he's going to respond. AJ, uh, I, I don't know. I take issue with that because there are it's in the very beginning of this book when Crocus first makes the deal with Cotillion is like, all right. I'm going to be mm-hmm. Cutter now. We get Absalar's inner thought that's like, or not actual inner thought, but we get that she's like, oh, I hate that. Like, that sucks. Yeah. You um, see, I always I, I always feel like it's her trying to protect him. Yeah, from I, the because she life. cares about him. No, dude, I fully disagree. I think that's more about her reflecting, taking on the burdens of violence and, and the life of an assassin onto yourself. And that she is projecting onto him that he's like, yes, I'm going to do this. I'm a violence man now. And she's like, you shouldn't do this. I am like, yeah. it is this burden on my life. And you are, yeah, you I, are yeah. er- making an error by doing this. Yeah, I did not because see she it cares as a about about him Why, she i didn't right, see as a right, compassion right. thing i yeah okay in, india, I india, 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 yes. get, well, india what do you think how do you feel about absalar's love or something of crocus listen love at the end of the something. day they're still kids man they can't express their feelings in a very con- productive way that also, is true she didn't even get to like fully live her life she then got turned into like another person then got her life back and then but it was not her life anymore she's this complete new person also now trying to navigate a relationship with a boy and he all he wants to do is make her happy he doesn't even like he's not even like looking into the deeper story i feel like he's just like oh she likes to kill me too now and she's like what the hell like that was never what i wanted that's not who i am that's what i am as a result of my freaking past. Yeah. And I, I think, India, I fully agree with you. And I think their Cutter and Absalar's naivete with love uh, is established through this conversation that Absalar has with Cotillion. Because he's, because he, Absalar's like, oh, he only loves the, the murderer part of me. That's why he tries to emulate that so much. And Cotillion's like, no, you idiot. Yes. Okay. <laughs> That's not Here, what I'm love hop- is. I'm hopping in. I'm hopping in. I have to defend my boy Cutter. He is not. He does not believe that Absalar likes killing. And I will say, yeah. however, that maybe that is what Absalar thinks like- because she's bad at feeling sometimes. He is like, okay, well, she's going to keep killing. So I guess the best way to stay by her side is to get good at it, too. Like, I don't want to kill people, but like, I got to be with her. You are- you know, it just feels like this all could have been solved with a very, very open and honest conversation between them. Well, that's yeah. what yeah, well. people in this series do not have open and honest conversations. <laughs> Do they? Yeah. <laughs> They're like, my feelings are a smoke. And then the, <laughs> then there's a sentence that's like, and then a man handed a woman an object. <laughs> and then we move on. Now, I, I really don't. Yeah, no. I, mu- I, I must. I, we must return. I um, we, we got to keep doing the show. But you are so wrong about both of you are sorely in, misreading. In the, I, I'm with you, Pete and Josh. You can go eat a eat a pee. Agreed. Can't I don't wait to kn- talk to Steve about it. Can't I don't know how you could it. possibly read Crocus's interest in Absalar as like healthy or an actual I never said loving healthy. interest. We never said it was healthy. We never said we healthy, and we actually did say healthy. that it wasn't actual love because they're children. I'm just saying. I feel like he. Facts. Oh my gosh, okay. <laughs> you are insane, and I. Ugh. It's uh, listen. We all understand. Pete's a chalice head. He still his head cannon is that crocus gets a chalice in the, at the fit. Um, I do love Cutter, and I I, I shan't. Oh my gosh. 
and but I gotta say, I really did not think this is what we were gonna blow up about. First, so. <laughs> I do love the the, the part where Absalar says there are two women in, within me, and Catillion says two. There are multitudes, and Cutter loves them all. She's like, yeah, you're 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 a deep person. You're multifaceted. <laughs> Oh my god. Insane. <laughs> Insane. All right. All right. Let's go to the next chapter. Okay. And, yeah. And also, cheers. also, Kalam's in the forest. So that's something. <laughs> yeah. But literally, <laughs> but yeah, who cares? Get, let's get going. <laughs> let's keep moving. Okay. It is now time for the part of the show where we like to thank our new patrons on our Patreon page. If you want to donate, you can go to patreon.com slash 10 very big books. Uh, we appreciate any and all donations that you give. There's some great rewards in there uh but i'm just gonna get into it and read through our new patrons uh thank you thank you thank you so very much to gerald sean matt thomas zach lady spanalot tharod jesper matt sean russell corporal knobs dr kirill and rm thank you all so much for donating to the show we really really appreciate it uh we are hoping that you are enjoying the bonus episodes if you want to join our patreon like i said you can go to patreon.com 10 very big books uh, you can read about all the rewards there and that's it thank you all so much for donating and let's keep on moving Chapter 24 Gamet looks over the camp, thinking on strategy for the impending battle. He meets with Tavor and discusses this, the Malazan army now in sight of Corblo Doms. Nil and Nether speak to them about the earth and spirits. They start to hear distant music and a song of voices. Gamet returns to his legion and tells them that unidentifiable soldiers may join them. The song is heard in Gamut, and he wants to be left alone. Fiddler struggles to hear over the song. Bottle helps him, and the two speak of the song, the bridge burners, and of the heiress all. Bottle says his grandmother would speak to him of the heiress all. Fiddler thinks more on returning to Raraku and wonders if this will be his last battle. In the Omen's camp, they can spot the Wiccans approaching. Korab rides to alert Mathok and the rebel army, and sees that other messengers had been slain. He luckily makes it through. Shaikh looks out on Tavor's and Korblodom's army. She thinks on the futility of this conflict. She thinks more on the desert and the Empress. She speaks to Camist Relo about the opposing mages, the Wiccans, and the chains that bind them. Hiborg speaks to Scalara about Bidithal, that the High Mage may be dabbling with powers out of his control. They both hear the growing song in the air. The two of them set out in the city, but are attacked by two of Corblo Dom's assassins. Hiborg defends them, but is wounded after some others attack. Scalara briefly flees, more assassins defend, but Ghost of Raraku save the pair. Scalara returns and goes to drag Haborak back to his temple to heal. Shaikh faces her armor and her battle ahead. As she begins to don the armor, Lorik enters and speaks to her of the dangers of the impending battle. Shaikh, though, says the goddess will protect her that there will be a great convergence. Korab arrives then to tell Shaik of the Wiccan. Lorik is dispatched to tell Corblo Dom of this, and that the Dog Slayer's command will be given to Leoman. Lorik sets out to deliver this message to Corblo Dom. He speaks to Dom about the impending battle and the whirlwind goddess's destruction. However, Dom's command is not to be usurped, and a knife strikes Lorik's back. He defends himself with magic, but he is sorely wounded. Bellison Younger speaks to Greyfrog about the knight and a potential ally. Then, Scalara finds her and tells her what happened to Hoboric. Nearby, the Tisleosian watch as Karsa Orlong rides to the oasis, and they are grateful the warrior did not spot them.
So the armies are preparing. Nil and Nether hear the sound of music, and they speak more about the spirits, and it's kind of uh, building more into what will become more pertinent at the end uh, in chapters 25 and 26. And they hear more that kind of some more unidentifiable soldiers might join them. And this is where Gamut is really hearing all this, and he and he's really in a lot of pain, and he goes and kind of lays down, I think. Right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And this is really preparing him for chapter 25 when, when the ghost of Iroku will off. rise. So, AJ, at this time, you know, I know we've talked, me and you have talked about Gamut before, what did you think about where the army stood and how much at this point were the ghosts something really on your radar? Because they're up up in book four and three, we've talked about them a lot, but they really emerge sure. into a new fold in this last ending. Yeah, I mean, the, the ghosts were, I don't know, they I, to say they were on my radar would be very generous to me. Um, <laughs> but but <laughs> to be honest, I should have known. Because we've talked to Steve several times, and every time we bring up his short story point of like, oh, well, don't bring something up if it's not important. Yeah. So, like, obviously it was going to be important, um, but my dumb ass was just like, nah. So, I didn't even, honestly, I didn't even think about how it had been addressed throughout the entire book until right this second. I I, I should have seen it coming, I think, is what I'm saying. Um, But in terms of Gamut... I'm just sad for my sad boy. <laughs> I, I feel bad. Uh, AJ was very um, upset. He met, he texted me last night about that. Oh well, that's yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, chapter. that's 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 later that I'll that I'm very upset. But so, c- quick question for you, Pete. Mm. Why why do they use Gamut's blood to do this ritual with Nether and Nil? That's a Ooh. good question. Can I can I can I try and posit an answer uh, or a guess? I have no none. So why don't you okay. posit away, buddy? Okay. Well, my answer is it ain't gonna be Nil and Nether because they're frail children even regardless of what age they are sure uh, and tavor has an ototero sword which we learned from lauren that the longer you have that shit the more your body just like yeah. don't do magic so they yeah. just kind of pretty probably just wanted like a normal human and gamut was there it didn't need to be his it could be any human yeah that right it didn't like, even seem like he was called to like hey go do this it was just kind of like he was like hey what's up and they were like hey can we use your hand for a second <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah i mean okay. i think it's very t- it's very within tavor's everything to just be like we need blood. Well, damn it, we'll do. Yeah, and I think because I was, I was also just thinking like before you said the attachment thing. I was like, well, why didn't they just use Tavor's blood? Because you know you want to make sure that they're loyal to you and blah blah blah. But mm-hmm. like Gamut is the most loyal person to Tavor, so he yeah. is the next best thing to just straight up using Tavor's blood, I guess. Yeah. I don't know. I think we just needed the POV character, and we're not allowed to see in Tavor Nil or Nether's head. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that is also a fact. India, going into this finale, Fiddler talks a bit to Bottle about the aerosol, another mention of these people, but he's also thinking a lot about if this is the battle he's going to die in. So did you think Fiddler would die in this finale? You know, what I would say is that, well, I mean, I don't know. I could never tell who's going to die, but Fiddler, I didn't think would because he just never does. But speaking of if he did die, would he have ascended? And if he would have, why didn't he just choose to die? I would have died. You would have died. And did, are they telling me that Whiskey Jack is ascended? I think. Yes, but that's And later. if so, where is he? These are the hard hitting questions that I have. <laughs> well... If only there was if only there was some sort of books we could read together to discuss. <laughs> you don't say. Yeah, but honestly, I didn't really care about Fiddler's conversation about him whether or not he was dying. The only thing I got from that was like, oh, they're not dead. Yes. But the song is growing, which I think is a great image. And what it's is kind the of the song though. What it's does like that the song. Mean? It's it's no it's, 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 it's a, there's a Indy, it's a literal song. I think but it's like Love Shack. And also, you know what? We're I think it's like freeform turn. jazz. <laughs> <laughs> I assumed it was like Tibetan throat singing, you know? I, just, it's a whirlwind. Just, it's definitely heavy metal. Just un, <laughs> just unlistenable jazz. Dun. Yes. <laughs> the best music. <laughs> Wait, but seriously. <laughs> what the hell? Why is it? I need to understand something. And if you don't, if I can't understand, it's fine. What did they mean that the bridge burners, like, in Roraku, what did that, like, what, what does that have to do with anything? Like, w- they were there, and then they left, and then they got tied back to it, and now the song calls them. But also, why is it also speaking to Gamut? Is he one too? JB? So I, okay, so I, I don't know about the Gamut thing, but so 
Uh, I think the main thing is that in this book, there is a, a constant mention of the fact that Reriku is just made up of cycles, right? And and it is in and of itself a giant cycle. Like the same things keep happening over and over again, right? And so the bridge burners, uh, or, and we've, we've learned that ascendancy kind of has to do with like being known, being legendary, like, pe- like people knowing about your deeds and stuff. So the bridge burners were made in Reriku, right? Like because of their, uh, their travel across it where like none of them died and they definitely all showed up or whatever and so the cyclical nature is like them coming back to the place where they were formed and kind of like completing that cycle like starting there leaving there coming back to there and then i mean most of it is like set in motion by in book two he meet a uh, fiddler meets that dude who's a tano spirit walker mm. who who's like uh they just kind of their voices are magical or something we don't really know a ton about them yet and he gifts them a song and so like the death of the bridge burners is what kind of sets the next part of motion because you have to die to become ascended it kind of sounds like and so like when they all die that starts their path to ascendancy but i guess it can't finish until they have completed their cycle within Reriku. and that all is nonsense because it is nonsense because it's crazy malazan world magic and it's not real but that's what that's the rules baby that's what you gotta work with you guys act like i'm so crazy when i say that i hate these books and then you say things like that (laughs) and i'm like India, this is, is this is the only shit that I like to read. I want to be here being like, what are we fucking doing? And also, I love it because it's so wild and out okay, of left. Yeah, like, Adrian said so that too. Crazy. And it's like, no. Josh, uh, we see Korab a bit here and we see him throughout this finale. So now that we see him a bit more throughout the entirety of, of this ending of House of Chains, what's your read on Korab Binathulis? I still don't know if he's important or not as a person, but his point of view is super important to us. Hmm. That is about all I have. Like, we learn so much by seeing through him, but, like, as a character, he's just kind of there, you know? That name he's... came out in this chapter, and I had no idea who it was. Well, because we he was the guy, he was the desert warrior India in the last section that we saw uh, riding with Leoman and the battle where they got blown up. Mm-hmm. And he was the he dude just... who put, like, he put the helmet on the bomb, and it just kind of, like, launched him into the yeah, air. Yeah. He was that dude. He was, he's the cartoon character. Um, <laughs> he does have big at Looney Tunes vibes. <laughs> big Looney yeah. Tunes. Energy. It's running over an empty cli- or a, a, a cliff. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't um, think you had that in you. <laughs> okay. Can I ask India a question? Please. India, I'm wondering, because um, you, you, you've you expressed that you have some has, uh, reservations about the end of this book. Uh, did you find the kind of destruction of like all of the alliances within Shaikh's camp like suddenly they were all killing each other did you find that that kind of happened without much warning and with really a lot of just things not explained like kind of i just yeah i mean i feel like i guess technically this whole time it's like well they're definitely gonna they're all com- like having these little plans which was very clear like they were all talking and making alliances and they're like haha but i'm not actually gonna do that so i knew that everything mm-hmm. would like fall apart, but it just happens like so uneventfully and so quickly. I, yes. like, in my opinion, like mm-hmm. everything that happened was like, oh yeah, and that happened. Like, like I didn't feel like anything was actually super like impactful throughout the yeah. entire end of the book. I think and maybe that's, that's con- the point. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, see, I think it's kind of intentional because the whole time yeah. Corblo Dom is like, well, here's what's going to happen, and then and then it starts happening, and it's just like. I think a big part of that is we have a lot of after the event point of views you know we have a lot of walking through the streets and there's dead bodies we go you know in the command tent the there's two mages dead already i you know using that after the fact kind of thing really it makes yeah like the impact is kind of gone aj did you know mathlock would be hyper important in this when we met him because i didn't care about him until all of a sudden i had to be like what do i know about this dude because he is everywhere right now (laughs) <laughs> no. I mean, no. I, I'm, I'm honestly, I'm having a hard time recollecting Mathok right now. Mathok's the guy who's like, he he's like the leader of the desert tribes that are fighting for Shaikh, right? And he's like, and he's an older warrior, like he's been doing yeah, this for a yeah, while, yeah, and he's yeah, really yeah. loyal to the With idea Leoman, of the rebellion. Right? Yeah, yeah, he's with Leoman, Leoman, and they Leoman. ride to Yucatan yeah. at the end. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So he just kind of was like not important it felt like until this chapter when it was like oh he's a good guy i don't know let's touch on the camp falling apart 
at the end, um, Haborg and Skalar speak a bit, but this is when Corbolo Dom's assassins first come out in full. They kind of ambush them a bit. Haborg gets wounded. He gets dragged oh, to the temple. Haborg rips a dude's head off. Yeah, he goes full <laughs> treach mode. And um, Skalara goes to goes to find Felicin younger, and um, kind of chaos is breaking out in Raraku, uh, in, in like the oasis. So where are you at with Haborik right now at the end of this book, India? I love Haborik. Haborik has really just done a whole freaking 180. Like, I mean, he was always cool, but like now, like he's like actually like physically cool. Hmm. And I really like him. I think he is. I, I have no idea where they're going toward the end, but I think that he's being he's being very strategic. I don't know what he how or why he wants Scalara with them. It was really interesting when that fight scene was happening because I'm like not used to somebody not fighting back. And she's just like, ah, yeah, that, that was funny. Um, like, I'm re- <laughs> like, I was just like, really? Like, you're not gonna. But um, I don't really know. I think that he has been doing a lot of crazy shit. I don't know. Like, I'm just a little confused about his journey, though, because I can't tell if he is, like, cool with who he is now or if he wants to go back to the other guy who he, the, the Jade Hands. My read, I, I think he, I mean, he speaks a bit out about about his indifference to Treach, but I do. Right, he, exactly. Yeah, I do think he kind of is growing in both that role, but also is engaged with this Jade part of himself right now. I think it's, um, I don't know, I, I, I like Haborg a lot, and I think him kind of having these different feelings about different part of his life is i don't know he's got a lot going Classic on that internal battle he's got a lot going okay. on that dude you know mm-hmm. um, yeah he does he's a good guy so shay calls some of her commanders together loric speaks to her and then she's like man let's have leoman take over the dog slayers loric why don't you go let corblo dom know that i've ousted him from the position and he sends loric <laughs> loric gets stabbed <laughs> Um, so, Josh, what did you make of this whole sequence and uh, this whole kind of last minute roster swap? Really quickly. Uh, it was the. F- oh, go ahead. Is this where you guys threw your books? No. No. Got it. I never threw my book. I loved all this. OK, Josh, hit me. I thought it was the funniest thing that's happened in this book, personally. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I, Lorik was such a non radar blip for me and then all of a sudden he's one of my favorite characters in this book and this scene is what cemented it for me because like he's like i can talk sense into her and she's just like go do this thing and he's like oh she don't she does okay so she's gone and then she's and then he's like yeah i'll just do it anyway though like I, I just actually, I actually feel like Lorik in this finale and throughout the whole book kind of reveals himself to be really dumb, I feel. I, like, here's the, I can't I cannot decide if he is the dumbest or smartest character in this book because he goes into this knowing he'll get stabbed and he's just like, but they don't know where my heart is because I'm a hot, I'm an elf and my heart's somewhere different. <laughs> that right? heart or like, or like I've hidden, I've hidden my life in magic, even if I bleed to death I right ju- here, I I'll just still feel be like alive. He's, <laughs> I feel like he's cloaked in the same type of sorceress secrecy see that at all these characters are. But then yeah. when push comes to shove, he's like, Dad. And then <laughs> yeah, yeah, the ending's not great for him. The ending's not good. Oh. You're never, yeah, you're never and then he's like, to meet your dad, man. Okay, bad idea, Shaikh, but I guess I'll do it for you. <laughs> I'm going to go speak to him. I go, and, like, I guess I understand that maybe he, like, wanted to... I, I mean, here's what I'll say. This action sparks Corbolo Dom's, like, freak out, which yeah. kind of spirals him to make mistakes. So in that way, if that was if that was Lorik's intentions, which we don't know, uh, he's then, actually then it's, brilliant. Yeah, then he's mm. out here playing 40 chess and, yeah. you know, just... Yeah. 10 steps ahead of us. I think that's I, some, I think that's some Monday morning quarterback revisioning though. <laughs> <laughs> Very generous. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's keep things moving, but it is worth noting that at the end of this chapter, uh, Felis- oh well, Fel- Skilara goes to the Grove, finds Felis and Younger, and they kind of make And Greyfrog. And Greyfrog, mm-hmm. he's there. The, the, the de- that demon boy is kicking it in this finale. Yeah. Um, he I- literally is the only reason that I laugh in this book. <laughs> it's, it's the funniest it's consistently so fucking good i love it like glee gets to eat humans <laughs> <laughs> i just love <laughs> I, 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 one that i would marry i read it to my boyfriend so and he was like why are you reading that i he only has to say whenever he says the singular word unsure I love yeah. like it's just because he's always he's just like, like he's like an he's android who has to like say what emotion he's trying yeah. to convey before yeah. he speaks it's the monotone so sentence 
My favorite so character, so by good. far. Sorry, Pete, I didn't mean to hijack that with Gray Fog speak. Please, but. please. And that, well, I, all I was going to say is Gray Fog's around, they make some plans, and then Carso rides towards the Oasis. Yeah. Um, Carso arrives at the perfect, perfect time. It's called books. Yeah. <laughs> I agree. Gotta love it. It's it's also, a convergence. I also yeah. back to Lork real quick. His his compatriots, the other Tistilosian, especially later on, they are some intense comedic relief whenever they are in scenes. In my oh opinion. my god, at the end of the book, yes, is it's yeah, so yeah. good. All right, they're the four. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Brother Aeneas, or whatever the <laughs> can't fuck. To, I can't wait to get to that part because it's so fucking. Funny. Let's keep moving. <laughs> Chapter 25 Febril sits on his ridge, channeling his warren and listening to Rerokil. Lorik has been dragged aside in the tent. He hears Dom dispatch several orders to his lieutenants. The omen's return is to be blocked. Febril is soon to be killed. Bidithal's spies are to be set upon, and word is to be sent to Tavor. Greyfrog slices through a nearby tent wall and drags him out. Danger is coming for Corbulodom. An assassin is looking for Scalara and Felicin, but he and his allies are suddenly slaughtered by Karsa. Karsa intends to find Leoman, but first he asks Felicin and Scalara where he can find Bidithal, Febble, Corbulodom, Camus Relo, and Haboric. He plans to kill them all. Mathok and his lieutenant Tamoral take up the Book of Drajna, which has been entrusted to them. Some of the clan is guarding Shaikh, others are riding to find Leoman. They agree to see how the battle will fare. Haboric feels Febril's sorceress web torn, sees ghosts in the city, and thinks on himself as Treach's reluctant destriant. He leaves his tent. Kalam takes his acorn and sets out. He battles some assassins who he suspects are talons. He follows a bloody trail into a temple, where he finds a young girl, corpses, and Bidithal. Bidithal invites him, saying he is the high priest of the broken and the chained, that Kalam can't return back to Lassine in chains of his own. Silgar offers him wine. They speak of the Hounds of Darkness, and Bidithal disappears into the darkness. Kalam calls on his Otateral blades, and Cotillion comes to help. Karsa finds Haboric's tent empty, Leoman's as well. He goes towards Bidithal's tent, where Silgar crawls out, speaking of a demon-like violence inside the tent. Silgar appeals to Karsa, declaring they are both of the House of Chains, that they are brothers. Karsa denies him and kills Silgar. Then he goes to follow the trail of Bidithal. Korab makes his way back to Leoman. Korab says that Leoman is to replace Dom, and they discuss Dom and his assassins. Leoman then decides to take his men and ride towards Shaikh. Kalam briefly thinks on the Warren of Shadows and Cotillion. Then he sets out to find Corblo Dom, who calls himself Master of the Talon. Kalam moves towards them and feels a hand on his shoulder and the voices of a soldier he knows. Kalam then finds Camus Relo and two assassins. He kills the assassins, and his acorn rolls free, from which Quickben springs. Quickben fatally dispatches Relo and greets his old friend Kalam. Together, they enter Corblo Dom's tent to see the Lieutenant Henaras dead on the table, a pearl affixed to her. Corblo Dom says he has sent word to Tavor that the Dog Slayers are ready to cut down Shaikh, and that together they can pacify seven cities. Kalam knocks Corblo Dom out, and Quick Ben shares the news of the dead bridge burners. Bidithal thinks on Shaikh and the Nappin's plan, but is caught by Karsa. Karsa throws him to the ground and rips Bidithal's penis off and shoves it in his mouth. Karsa damns him for his actions, and Bidithal dies. Lestara nearly leaves, but Cotillion stops her, saying that their job is near done. That soon the whirlwind goddess would open a massive gate to swallow the oasis, 
and that she is beginning to be manipulated by the House of Chains. Febril has protected him and senses what has happened to the Nappen. Then Karsa finds Febril and kills him. Karsa hears Urugal screaming, being pushed away from the oasis. However, Karsa pushes forward, ghostly chains dragging taut behind him. He does not yield, and the chains will break, or their resistance end. And Karsa moves on. Gamut lies in the cot in intense pain. He blacks out and wakes up without pain, armored and amongst soldiers. He finds Grub, who commands him forward. Gamut rides with the dragon, helmed rider. He rides with the burned tears, and they attack the dog slayers. Screams are all around, and the sound of battle, but it is distant. Together with the other soldiers, Gamut defends memories and slays the dog slayers. He thinks on Tavor and says goodbye. Fiddler and Cork speak about the battle in the morning, and if it will not come. They listen to the song and think the bridge burners have ascended. Then the darkness above the oasis changes. The Omen and Mathic speak together about the rising ghosts of memories, the desert's own memories. Mathic will take the holy book and ride to the city of Yucatan. The holy book is history, not prophecy. The Omen rides with Korab towards Shaikh. Quickban and Kalam are carrying a bound and gagged Corblo Dom. They speak about the song. It's the Tano Spirit Walker song of the Bridge Burners, now sanctified by their death. The Bridge Burners are ascending as a company. However, Kalam is uncertain of the growing darkness. Then Kalam says the Hounds of Darkness have arrived. The Daragoth descend on the oasis, only to meet Karsa Orlon who steps forward and offers them a warning before wounding one and killing the other. Quick and Kalam watch Karsa's battle, and they decide to escape the oasis altogether. Haboric and Laoric meet together. They speak of the House of Chains' sanctification and entrance in the Deck of Dragons. They speak more of the crippled god, Karsa, the Daragoth, the Knight of Chains. Haboric will take Velus and Younger and flee with Greyfrog. Laoric goes to find Shaik. He wants to save Velison before the whirlwind goddess can claim her. Karsa hunts down the other Daragoth, but Korab and Leoman collide into the Hound by chance and helps Karsa with the battle. Leoman says he needs Karsa's help. Pearl leaves the oasis, but doesn't find Lestara. Rather, he finds Kalam. Kalam hands over Corblo Dom and says Pearl owes him. Kalam leaves with hidden footsteps aside him. Pearl then watches the dawn. So we were just talking about him, but Lorik is kind of dragged aside. Um, he hears about all of Corblo Dom's various plans. He sets out for all of Corblo Dom's co-conspirators to be killed. And then Grey Frog like slice opens the tent wall, is like, yo, bro, I got you. And like, you know, <laughs> saves the day. <laughs> um, so what did you make of all of this? And uh, what did you make of Corbolo Dom's scheme? I know we see it all fall apart, but do you think he ever really had a shot? Um, no, because as far <laughs> as I understood reading this book, literally the only, like, as I mentioned, I was very confused, but it appeared that Raraku ghosts just fucked everything up. Fact or fiction? Fact. Fact. So in that way... How could he have ever stood a chance? He had all these plans and they were, then none of them were very. Can I, I want to, can I hop in and ask a big question? Hit me. Hit it. What? Okay. Because agreed, all of his plans were shit. With the exception of, is, is he actually the master of the Talon that they were looking for? <laughs> like, had, is he like a secret great assassin and has all of these great assassins? I was so confused by this. Because he got called master of the Talon, but it, it felt very out of place. Hmm. Why do you feel like it's out of place? Oh, AJ, what? Well, I was just going to say, because earlier in the book, I don't remember who it was, uh, but someone said rising to positions just like from being there and uh -huh. like 
I feel like maybe he became master of the talent just because he was around so long. So and like maybe was, at some point he was competent, but yeah, now so he's like, not. Was he a talent ever? That that's I, what confuses me, right? Because I can't imagine he's master of the talent unless he is one. But he is, as far as I know, just a, a Malazan general who's you know been doing a thing and was a fist. So how could he have ever been a talent in order to be their master? Those are the whole. That's the whole thing with the talents, dude. Second, They're everywhere. Second, all of his talents were just like people from seven cities that it sounds like he didn't meet awfully long ago. I don't. I don't know. I, I had a lot of questions about that plot line. Because they my, were very effective, but go ahead, in, Peter. In my reading of it, he mostly, I would say, is almost co-opting the 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 yeah. the name of the Talons. Because see, that's what I thought. But then even people like Kalam, who is not even in the plot lines where they talk about fucking Talons, unless maybe he's a little bit. I don't know. He was just like, oh, it's Talons, and I was like, what makes you think that? I besides mean, seven foot spacing. I mean, <laughs> ultimately, I guess people could just start calling themselves Imperial Claws if they really want to. I mean, I've, yeah. I've been doing that for some time. I get a lot of looks at work. Yeah. Um, but. OK. Uh, um, someone okay. earlier on said something like someone outside of of uh, Shaikh's thing said something about a Talon Master, which makes me think maybe he is an actual Talon Master. But well, I, no, it I, was I it was Cotillion was looking for the Talon Master. Like he w wanted to find him because right. there was a Talon on the island with the Tisty Eater and uh, the Tisty Andy. Yeah. So Karsa kind of kills some assassins in the city, and then Mathok and Tomoral will take the Book of Drajna and kind of leave, and we can talk more about that in a second. But I wanted to come mm -hmm. to Kalam, who goes, uh, fights some assassins, and then follows their trail into this temple and confronts Bidithal, and then he draws his Otatero blades, and then Cotillion arrives. India, what did you think of Kalam finally making his way into Reriku to this scene? Kalam is cool because he's a very good assassin. Sure. The extent of my feelings for Kalam is that. I, <laughs> I don't understand. I still don't understand the, like, there's just so many parts to understand about what, what's going on. Why is he doing this? What is the point? Why is he there? I don't get it. I still don't. You know, he killed Inge, all those talons. That's great. Inge, I mostly agree with you. Out of characters that really resonate with me, Kalam has never been one. I mean, he certainly is good at the stabbing. You know, you can't and it, and deny it. And it's entertaining it. to see, I, to read. I do, and I, mm -hmm. I like that, you know. But I also, I just, I don't, I'm just not interested. I'm not invested in his journey, like, in this book. Prior, I think it was pretty interesting. But for this book, I'm, I mean, I'm glad he was there, but... <laughs> You were just a, a side character to me. Mm, right. Damn. But mm -hmm. we cut to outside the tent uh, when once kind of the battle starts, where we find Karsa, who kind of searches the ground, find Haborik's empty tent, Leomans as well. And then he goes and finds Silgar, who has crawled out. And he's like, yo, it's me, your fellow House of Chains member. You're the knight. I'm the <laughs> leper. We get along. And then Karsa is like, doesn't accept his new position. He really keeps trying to turn down this position. <laughs> um, and then kills Silgar and then goes off to find Bidithal. I was yeah. happy when he did that. Not going I like when he kills Silgar and he's like, man, Leoman was right. I should have just killed him before. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Would have saved some time. Um, I kind of really like that moment when Silgar's kind of tempting him. He's like, you should go in and kill these two. Like, say, save mm -hmm. us, you know? Did I? Did anyone think that Karsa would? No. 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 I feel like if no. anyone tells Karsa to do something, he's just like... It, almost assuredly he'll do the opposite. That is not my journey, yeah. and it is my yeah. decision to make my journey. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. how, how, first, how dare you? <laughs> Second. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. So Korab meets up with uh, Leoman, and then he they, they're kind of deciding what to do because Le they've just received word to go meet up with the dog slayers. So eventually they decide to do this, but Korab's has seen that some other assassins have been here, and he narrowly makes it through. AJ, do you have a big read on Korab in any part of this? No. Uh, I feel like he's just kind of loyal to Leoman presently. Yeah, uh, I don't really feel like he's much deeper than that. 
Well, let's leave it there then and push on to another big chunk where Kalam, you know, he thinks a little bit about Cotillion and all this, but then he's like, I'm going to go find Corblo Dom. He goes out, he kills some assassins, he he follows Camest Relo, and then Quick Ben, pow! you know, Quick Ben shows up and like, you know, the, the theater goes wild and, um, <laughs> uh, you know, together they kill Camest Relo and then they go in and find... Um, a pearl on a dead Henaris, and then they find Corblo Dom, and Corblo Dom is like, I've won. We're gonna get Shaikh to surrender. <laughs> yeah. Like, I've sent word to the adjunct. And then the dude gets fucking blasted in the face. <laughs> yeah. He gets fucking punched. Knocked Josh, out. you're flailing your hand. I, I have to get in here on this, because this is this bothered the shit out of me when I'm reading this. Okay. I that This has to actually be Corblo Dom's plan, right? Like, what do you mean? I, <laughs> like, I feel like a big part of his... I feel like maybe all along he was going to try and get Tavor to be like, nah, 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 we're on the same side. And that just seems like the dumbest thing I've ever heard because he crucified an entire army. And how does he think that that is not the only thing people think about him all the time? You know yeah. what I mean? I don't... Like, even if this is, like, the last-ditch gamble, it's not even one you make because there, it, there's just a zero... It just blew my mind. It was very confused. Why did they not kill him? Uh, because they want a fate worse than death for him for the moment. Slash... I don't know. Something they like that. Deliver him to the Empress. Yeah, it's... I, I gotta tell you, whatever happens to him ain't gonna be good. Ugh. Uh... I do want to. Oh, I do want to say very. I love. I love Steve's choice to be like. There's a witch, Hanara. Because I was like, I don't want to kill another bad guy. I don't care about this person. <laughs> and then it's just like, it's okay. They're already dead. Pearl was here. Here's your hint. Yeah. And I was like, thank you. Do thank you, you. It's a pearl. Do you get it? <laughs> um, India, what did you make of this little uh, sequence with Kalam and then Quick Ben's surprise appearance in the book? So. My question is, when he rolled the egg corn, did he, when, when the egg corn <laughs> fell from the tree, oh, did he know, that, like, was it just an egg corn that fell from a tree and they were like, okay, I'm going to, like, 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 what, I need to understand, did he know when the egg corn fell? Because he said something when it fell, that, like, yeah, like, what he was did, the point? He it? said something like cryptic a, as a joke yeah, or something. Yeah. They did I, for, or I forgot so even like, that the egg corn fell that egg corn. and, oh. I, I forgot that he picked it off the ground. I was just like, I guess he's had an egg corn the whole time. I liked oh, it because oh, it was, no, wasn't, I, that yeah. like, wasn't a quick Ben with the egg corn head guy? Yeah. Um, Talamandus is his name. Oh, shit. Yeah. Forgot about Talamandus. I thought that was, I don't know if that was like intentional, but if it was. Well, and the egg cute. corn is a, is a thing in the, in Gardens of the Moon, right? Yeah, the finest. Yeah, that's a finest, but I think that's a pretty different thing. I could relate yeah, to Talamandus. Yeah, but Talamandis. when he throws it, I thought that when he threw it, they were like, oh no, it's like a, a thing. Like there's going to be some big magic thing that happened. Like I, not just like a distraction of an egg corn on the ground. I thought it was like. Steve's just, Steve's just horny for acorns. Quick Ben shows up. I definitely Quick know ben that. Quick Ben does show up, yeah. I love Quick Ben. I love him and Kalam. They're so yeah, cute. Same, See, that's a romance ben. that I could truly ship. I agree, and we'll get to it later when there's the big group hug at the end. Gotta love oh, it. You know? Beautiful, beautiful. Um, but then, India, uh, Karsa, <laughs> in, in Reriku, goes and finds Bidathal, who's, like, doing some more scheming, but he then kind of dismembers him and uh, kills kills Bidathal. So what did you think of this? Okay, okay. I just have some questions. If Bidathal was like so like powerful that they were like, okay, yeah, let's not fuck with him. Why now? What happened to his power that Karsa was just able to just be like, I'm going to grab it, I'm going to squeeze it, I'm going to rip it off. How? Karsa is like partially immune to magic because of all the years of the blood oil from and the and the blood stuff bloodwood from his homeland well india are you asking about why bitathal this moment was so weak that he was so easy to kill or are yes, you asking that's what i'm asking that's okay. what i'm asking yeah i think it has to do with that i also think to do with that he's coming off fighting cotillion and kalam which i would imagine weakens him and you know it was, it was well, taxing he also him physically and emotionally i imagine he wouldn't really be expecting it either yeah. because they're was, both they're most members of the house of chains yeah i was gonna also say it's kind of like right now he is like he is super overextended him and February both i think that's what's their downfall is they are like they are keeping track of everything everywhere except literally right around them because they're so confident no one could get through all of their sensory shit yeah jo josh how did you feel about this 
the, the I thought the kill was the most satisfying and also worst thing I've ever I read. I hate when they mentioned because I've hated Bidithal this whole time, but I was like, even him, maybe not this. is a t- It was a tough read. Mm. I feel like definitely that, if anything. <laughs> uh, I have to say, I personally do not like this at all, and I find it very unsatisfying to the bit to the to the bit of Thal storyline. I, I I know Steve's trying to take an exploration of maybe that type of point of view here in this book, but mm-hmm. I mean. The answer of we should kill the bad man, I don't think is a particularly interesting one or an insightful one. And I don't think seeing the real bad dude be br- be killed very brutally. I, yeah. like, I, I get nothing out of that there besides, are... I guess, some fleeting satisfaction that like a really bad person was murdered. And I... some part of me is like, huzzah, I guess. Yeah, like the Febril thing. OK, so I'm going to juxtapose it with Febril, right? The Febril... Carsa getting him felt better to me because that was just kind of like I don't care about him he's definitely the weakest link of the of all of them I just need his storyline ended and that was a quick way to it I don't you know versus like the Biddlethal thing like it was such a big part and for it to just kind of like for this dude to just kind of like and then he dies that's that was my issue yeah and that solves everything and that's why I think this ending for his storyline it just leaves me with nothing because ultimately I feel like he was just a really bad dude who gets murdered. And yeah. I, I don't I don't feel like I, I don't see anything else there in, in my reading of it. And AJ, what do you think? You know, I, I think I, I fully agree. Um, I felt unsatisfied after it. Because it, like you said, Pete, it's just like, oh, the bad guy dies in a horrific way. And then we see that he's going to be tortured by demons forever, which yeah. is like, OK, OK, yeah, I guess. <laughs> um, but like then it just made me think like, well, if this is how he's going to end, why even have him in the book at all? <laughs> yes, yes, that's exactly. Uh, yeah, it, his it, it, all it did was like hurt other characters. I don't know, but that could have been happening. I don't know. I I'm with you, AJ. Yeah, I think there could have been other ways that like Felison, like, you know, Felison Younger became, you know, broken or whatever. Like she was. I, it, <sighs> It didn't need to be what and you know. Oh, there didn't need to be a whole cult Wasn't about she it. Already broken. Like, why did we have to re-break her? I agree. Yeah, the whole point I'm of her little you. orphan story. Yeah, yeah, yeah is, exactly. Yeah. It could have just been like, oh yeah, she's an orphan. That she could have watched rough. Shaikh die, like, that's, and that be pretty... and break. That could have broken her. You know. Yeah, yeah. I, I, Bitafal was a bad character, and I don't think he needed to be in this book. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Well, yeah, I I never thought of it the way you guys are saying. Like there, were, like I was just like, oh yeah, that makes sense. That is what he said he would do, so he did it. But um, sure. when you put it that way, though, I do get what you're saying because then, like, I mean, what was the point right. of this character if he, it, it was just yeah, it was I don't know. But then again, and there's everything. E- I, go ahead. I was just gonna say, and there's even there's even another way for a character to be introduced and die to be like, oh well, they were pointless, like. I don't know. It just kind of feels like the point that I was trying to be made with Bitathal was just like bad people exist, period. It's just like, uh, OK, yes, I, I, I do think Steve was trying to say I, I sorry, I, I don't want to address it to Steve. I do think the book is trying to get at something more there, but I don't really think it goes anywhere. And if, the, the, and right. if this is the ending, it makes me feel I don't know, man. Yeah, I, I, I think there's an interesting juxtaposition that could be made between Memories of Ice being all about compassion and this book being all about vengeance slash balance. Mm-hmm. Um, but which which I think is part of the point. I mean, obviously, yeah. in, going into this finale, it is all about all these characters that are dealing with these chains and these things they're holding on to and their right. past it is it is all right. about how they ultimately come to deal with it, which I do think there's thematic cohesion between a lot of these storylines. So that is Were something. You guys- <laughs> Were you guys English majors? <laughs> The hell with all these insightful thoughts. I literally, I literally did not even ever think about it like that. Wow. Great job. Thank you guys. That's a very helpful thought. Because I like I just wonder what the point of any of these books is, really, other than like the (laughs) obvious story. But then you guys are like, oh yeah, and the juxtaposition between like forgiveness and I'm um, with India. I'm always just like words on page book. Yeah, I do not think well, usually to think about it that way, especially when it comes yeah. to the conversations with Steve, because I'm just like so. <laughs> but yeah, I appreciate your guys's uh, actual like analyzing of this because I 
I just don't. It's tough because I kind of just want to break down into a big conversation about the book, but I think I kind of want to keep walking through this And we finale. have a wrap-up episode that can do that, too. Um, yeah, we have to give the people what they want. <laughs> so... <laughs> So there's a scene with Lestara and Febril, but we're going to move past them for now because to build on what we were talking about these chains, I think the metaphor about the chains kind of representing your past or what you're dealing with or the suffering is most made explicit, I feel, in this section where Karsa feels these spectral chains drawing on him. And he says something how they will either break or the the resistance will end and he like strains against them but ultimately is able to move on i really like this passage and i think it's getting at that you know that these things in your past are something that karsa he is trying to drag along or drag against and ultimately um i don't know josh what did you make of all this in these chains we're in the house of chains I don't know. I can't tell if it's a metaphor or not ever. A lot of I mean, times, go ahead. Def- I'm just going to say it definitely is. Right? Yeah. Be. I, I, I have real problems reading uh, it because like I'm not good at metaphors a lot of the time like i'm i i so i only read like the actual literal stuff and then i'm like this means something next i so Mm. i don't i'm not really sure so aj you mentioned it earlier this brings us to a a long Mm. part of the book that not only resolves what's happening with the ghost of reriku and the dog slayers but it also resolves gamut's story as he kind of lies in a bed joins the battle and eventually says goodbye and later we learn he dies of this blood clot but Really, this is kind of the finale for him in this time. Just a quick question about that scene. Was he dead already yes. when he did that? He, yeah. he dies at the beginning of this scene, yeah. Did yeah. you guys, you don't know that, though, until no. he, they I, say that he died, right? Or did you? Because when he said goodbye, I thought they were just leaving. Yeah. AJ and I texted about this last night, and we both agreed that while reading this scene, we were like, I should be get. There's something here I should know. <laughs> yeah. And then the next yeah. day, we were like, fuck. It was right there. just randomly Could've like, yeah, let's go. Let's go fight. Yeah. Well, because it's because I, I this didn't even click at the moment. And I feel so fucking dumb because <laughs> um, it's it's he it starts with him lying on his cot. And he's like, man, this this pain really sucks. It's been days. Uh, and then groaning, he clambered sideways from the cot and halted his on his hands and knees, head hanging down as waves of trembling shivered through him. I need to move. I need to act something, anything I need. And then it just says a time of blankness. Then he found himself standing near the tent flap. So that is where he died. And his ghost was then standing at the tent flap. But for Mm -hmm. me, it was just like, oh, he blacked out because he's got this headache. Yeah. Now he's at the tent flap. And fucking duh. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, that felt so dumb. It's just, I think, I think part of what is so, what was, or what was so hard to track with that is that like, dude just has like an aneurysm, which is like the least <laughs> fantasy death. Yes, that's that's what makes it. I think it hurts worse than most because it's for so sure. mundane. Yeah, because it's like, oh, he got hit in the head with the horse, duh. Yeah, and so it like really fucked his brain up. <laughs> It's like when a character in a book like breaks like it would be like if a character in a book broke their arm and like Oregon Trail style died two weeks later because it didn't heal right. Yeah, it's like, oh, they you got know? cut on a nail and they shit themselves to death. Like, yeah. like they had broke cholera. their leg and then it didn't heal right and then they died. Yeah. Well, okay. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but uh, yeah. Okay. He got stabbed through the chest by a sword. It's not that his knee yeah, he got broken, stabbed through the chest by a big he bone, died. man. I think that's sword but, killed but him. Yes. Yeah. I, exactly. It's the mundanity of that. That yeah. is just like it didn't even. There wasn't even a blip on my radar that was like, oh, maybe something weird happened here. It was just like, oh, maybe he blacked he out because like he's a in pain. Problem. And yeah, <laughs> <in my> head, <laughs> maybe he needs to see a doctor. Yeah. <laughs> Western medicine. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's just really, and I don't know. I want to read this section again now, knowing that like this is his his mm. death rattle, pretty much. Um, because in the moment, I was like, "Hell yeah, dude! Like, like chase your bliss. Go, you know, say goodbye to Tavor. You've you've been in mm-hmm. service to her your whole life. You know, it's time for you to move on." And I was like really happy for him. And then the beginning Same. of the next chapter, I was yeah, like, yeah. "Fuck me! I'm so sad." <laughs> Yeah. Um, so I, I just uh, I love Gamut and I, you know, I'm happy that he is able to move on with these spirits of Reriku. Um, but man, is it sad? Mm-hmm. Man, does it make me sad? Yeah. So I mean, 
ultimately he's kind of coming back to himself in a way. I mean, really, it's yeah, it, yeah, it's he's his coming memories. back to being a soldier, which is That's all he which wanted is like the whole time. what he right exactly. He wanted to be a soldier this whole time, and then oh man, she will understand and be pleased as am I. Goodbye, adjunct Tavor. Like, that is so sad when you read it fuck. again. Yeah. Fuck. Yeah. Fuck. First, it was like a happy goodbye. And yeah. Then it's like, mm. I was like, yeah, dude, do it. Go for it. <laughs> it's just like, but like, shit. isn't it still happy, you know? It is still happy, but it's also the, the man, the, the, the dude died. Yeah. Like, maybe he ascended. I have to say, I, I think it. Gamut is my <laughs> favorite character of this book. You know, mm. I don't think he's really the central character of this book in, the, in any sure. way. I, you're, Josh, you're giving me a big no-no sign, but I've always really Indy liked agrees him. With, Indy agrees with me. I, I feel disagree. like Gamut has a re- one really good scene and then a very sad ending, and the rest of the book, he's just kind of like, I wish there. I was a soldier. I'm bad at leading. Like, that's like most <laughs> of his character. I'm a born Eat my, POV. Eat we, my we, ass. We are really splitting the podcast down the middle of this episode, because I agree, I agree with Pete. I think he's not, I don't think, I don't know if he's my favorite character, but he, his character hits me in a way that Idkovian hit me. I knew uh, you were going to say that. I knew <laughs> you guys. Well, I don't know. If he's Peter just a good way. dude who, you know, who meets a tragic end. Like, I, I just, I love those characters. He's man. no Idkovian, like, but I know yeah, what you're saying. He's no Idkovian, yeah, yeah, but it's yeah, like yeah, the same, yeah. it's the same vibes. You it's know what I mean? It's a very like, similar vibe. I got I the that, same I feelings. That. And I, I obviously, I wasn't as sad when Gamut died as I was when Idkovian died because Idkovian, it was like made this huge deal of and... Also, Edkovian did did a lot. Like Gamut didn't really do a whole lot, honestly, uh, except be loyal to Devor and like kind of make that his whole life. But I, I don't know. I I agree with Pete. I really really love Gamut in this book. We're gonna keep moving, and Fiddler and Korok speak a little bit about the song of the Bridge Burners. But I wanted to quick touch on Leoman and Mafic for maybe the last time. Um, so they speak a, a little bit about the Holy Book of Drajna. And then it's not a book of history, but it is a book. Uh, sorry, it's not a book of prophecy. It is a book of history. And then they yeah. agree that the rebel forces should retreat to the city of Yucatan. So, mm-hmm. Josh, um, what did you think about this conversation about the book of Drajna? And what do you think about these rebel forces? So I forgot that there was a literal book, honestly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I thought it was interesting to learn that Mothok was like, oh, yeah, my tribe and me, like, we put, like our job is to hold and protect this book. And I was like, didn't know that. That's pretty cool. Um, in terms of the rebels, uh, I have to say that at, it was at this point that it all felt kind of pointless. And I think if I was a rebel, I would feel so unbelievably disillusioned. Yeah. Because at this point, like, your renegade Malazan allies are dead. All of your high mages are dead. It was all for naught. You find out that, like, none of the people who ha- who you thought were fighting for you, none of them were. You had a cra- you have a crazy goddess who just wants to make this her own kingdom and doesn't need humans in it. You have all these other people who were like, I don't care what happens to seven cities. I just want to cement my place where it belongs. I just feel like I would I would just go home. I'd be like, yeah. I guess at this point, I'm just gonna, I'm farmer now. I'm, yeah. I'm farmer mathic. I, I don't know. I felt. I feel. I honestly feel more sympathy for the the like native rebels in this book than I do. I think for anybody else. I I feel really bad for them. I fully agree. And something we'll talk about a little bit later. I really am. I do not like the Malazan Empire at all, and their colonialist effort on this continent. Is. Yeah, it's it's very hard to decide because like you hear that the Malazans aren't perfect, right? There's definitely things that they do that are not great. But you also hear several times that before the Malazans, like the like the level, like it just basically was like wherever you're born really determined exactly how much freedoms you had and how much law there was and like how you know that kind of stuff. And I get the idea that like having a set amount, you know, set laws order can be good, but I I, I don't know. It's it's very. I mean, there's no. I'm not here to solve imperialism. That's not my job on this podcast. So uh, it's very interesting. And I, I do. I just feel so bad for all of them. You're just not going to talk me into the imperial effort, Josh. Um, I'm just, yeah, I know. I know. But let's so quick. Ben and Klom briefly are like carrying around Corblo Dom and they're like speculating about the future. And then they they kind of see the Daragoth arrive and they kind of watch Karsa kill one and then the other one gets away, and um, sorry, they watch Karsa suplex one. 
Let's go. <laughs> grab him Let's and fucking <laughs> suplex it. While the other one is eating his leg. Keep in mind, there's <laughs> something crazy. So, Inge, what did you think about the Hound of Darkness emergence into this climax and then their their quick disposal? Okay. <laughs> um. Okay, nice comment. <laughs> <laughs> like... What's the point of these? What, 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 okay. Where do these, where do they come from? Who summoned them? Troll and Unrak broke the statue that they were trapped in. What's the point of them? <laughs> yeah. To be what big and scary. What is the of them in this? Like, what is, I just don't understand the, why even discuss it? Why is it even in there? Oh, wow. He killed really strong dogs. At best, mm-hmm. India. I think it's showing how much more powerful the the Warren of Darkness is than Shadow. But like that's a straight. I mean, I, we, there's other ways to do it. We don't need two big scary dogs. Yeah, I, I didn't have any super like wow feelings about it. It was just like, oh, Cars is still strong. Awesome. I, I do think there's a part here where it is about the crippled god in the House of Strange trying to amass power, right? About trying to claim this fragment of Kral Dumeroin, about mm-hmm. trying to have the High Mage Bidithal, about how, trying to have Karsa have all these things, and, and that includes them trying to, you know, the crippled god trying to uh, co-opt the Daragoth in a way, but I agree, that's my most generous defense. I mostly feel like you do, that I mm-hmm. guess Karsa was good at killing these dogs, you know? Also, does anyone else get, like, a strong One Punch Man vibe from Carso whenever, <laughs> like, especially when he's killing these dogs? Yeah. India, you don't know what that is, and that's fine. It's a very good anime. Furthermore, Steve, <laughs> the weeb evidence, you For, know? Yeah. More, yeah. <laughs> We've got a weeb alert. Uh, okay, that's all I have. Weeb alert. <laughs> okay, um, so there's a few more things at the end of this chapter. <sighs> But Haborik and Lorik speak a bit about the House of Chains being entered properly into the Deck of Dragons. They try Ooh. to speculate about the Crippled God, kind of like what I was just saying. And then eventually Haborik and Felis and Younger and Greyfog and Scalara are set out. Whilst Lorik goes to find Shaikh, I even think they say something like, let's like try and save both Felisons, if, like save one Felison if you can yeah, or something. Yeah, hold on, wait, I, I, marked, I marked the quote. Uh, there are two Felicins, Lorik then murmured, eyes half failed, save the one you can, Haboric Light Touch. Yeah. And then he and then he does. So what did I think of this? Sure. Yeah. I mean I, cool. We're all we, we all have a we all have new missions now, I think. Uh, yeah. Like we are no longer except maybe Lorik is kind of still doing the same thing, trying to trying to, to save Sha- Shaikh or whatever, uh trying to salvage this Shaikh situation. Yeah, I think this for me, this part's kinda weirdly placed because it's like not really with anything else in the rest of this chapter, but they'd like need to get out of Roroku before it like floods. So mm-hmm. I guess this needs to happen now. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, the I think the weirdest part about this section for me is the postulation on the crippled god, because like Like a lot of stuff's going wah. on. Yeah, it's just like I mean I guess these characters need to talk about it. I guess Haboric needs to think about it because he's now uh, you know, Destrian of Treach. I don't know, especially with with where Lorik ends up at the end of this chapter. It's just like going back to his childhood bed. Like, I, <laughs> I don't know. It was just kind of a it's kind of a weird section. There's some great gray frog bits in there. It, like he has like a whole paragraph where he just like keeps saying the emotion that he's trying to convey. It's very good. But yeah, uh, I don't know. Heboric and and uh, Scalara are on their way to save Felis and Younger. And Lorik is going to go say hi to Shaikh again. <laughs> Well, let's talk a little bit more about that, but it's quick noted that Pearl and Lestara get Corblo Dom at the end of this chapter, and then Kalam and Quickben go off a separate way. But let's talk more about that. The Cotillion squad meets up for a second. That's true. Let's talk more about that in the final chapter. Chapter 26. Shaikh looks inward towards her life as a girl, then to the whirlwind goddess. Shaikh sees that the goddess's hatred is insane and out of proportion, however that she and the goddess walk the same path. Shaikh then dons her armor and her helm. Loric walks towards the dog slayer's camp, but it is quiet. Kerald Merlin is waking, and the whirlwind goddess prepares to claim it and devour Reriku. He nears Shaikh's hill, and Karsa comes upon the Tistli Ocean. Karsa speaks of those he has killed, and others dead. Karsa says the dog slayers have been slaughtered. 
The Yeoman believes the rebellion can be saved, but Shaikh must join them and flee Reriku. Shaikh then steps over the hill, and Lorik opens his warren to go to her. The whirlwind goddess thinks of her fury, and her once husband's betrayal. Her husband's drawing of another woman, and then his exile from their clan. The goddess's rage had not died, and burns hot. She is ready for her vengeance. Shaikh descends down the hill, and she ignores the calls of Karsa and the omen. Captain Kenneth comes to the adjunct Tavor and says that Gamut has died of a brain clot. Tavor steadies herself when hearing the news. She asks for to Amber, but words has come that Shaikh has entered the basin and offered a challenge to Tavor. After short consideration, Tavor dons her armor and goes. Laoric has entered the goddess's warren and finally can see her. An ancient, furious Imanis chains slowly coming to her body. Laoric tries to shout out to the goddess. She is stuck in a web of vines, but then Laoric is stabbed. Corblodom's talons ambush the goddess and kill her. Chains snaking over her fallen body. Laoric is dying, but Osric appears to save him, saying he will bring Laoric home. Shaikh stumbles, the whirlwind goddess gone from her. Tavor descending towards her. Shaikh feels like Felicin once more, and she says blood is the chain, the chain that can never break. Tavor draws closer, her weapon drawn. Then Felicin and Tavor are the same, and that blood is heavy, so heavy. A sword punches through Felicin's chest, and she falls down, looking to her sister, wondering why Tavor did not love her. Wondering what their mother would think. The omen is shocked, seeing Shaikh killed, and he turns to Karsa. The omen decides he will ride to Yucatan with the others, but Karsa won't join him. They say goodbye. Pearl and Lestara Yil watch Felicin's death, and they walk down the hill towards Tavor. They see the Crow Clan standard raised over the Dog Slayer's camp, the song crescendoing. And then Tavor greets them. Pearl offers Corblo Dom to the adjunct, then reports to Tavor that they found Felicin, and she is dead. Tavor asks for certainty, and they offer it. Then she leaves to find her officers. Pearl and Lestara decide to bury Felicin's body, and agree that Tavor looks alone. Tavor joins her commanders, saying to send scouts to the Dog Slayer's camp, and that Corblo Dom has been delivered to them. They speak of those ghosts that attack the Dog Slayers and who is amongst them. Captain Kindly and Lieutenant Pores reported to Tavor. The adjunct then says that the army will ride after Leoman, declaring that the rebellion will be ashes on the wind when they're done. Then Karsa Orlong rides to them and says the Malazan are not his enemies, and he rides away. Lieutenant Rannell rides forward with Fiddler and Cuddle behind them. The other squads have not joined. Rannell notices some fleeing warriors and ignores warning and rides dangerously into a sandstorm. Gessler sees Tisleosian riding towards them, and he uses his new munitions crossbow to cause a huge explosion and scare off the Tisleosian. Jorad recovers with the other Leosian, and they speculate about Gessler, and then decide to retreat to their realm. In the sandstorm, Fiddler is knocked off his horse. He almost loses his bag of explosives, but Korab briefly catches it before returning to the ground. A nearby explosion is massive and nearly lethal. Fiddler hears a voice and cries out to who he thinks is Hedge. Then Cuddle finds them and he learns Rannell has died. That Fiddler has lived and the song of Reriku and his heart are matching in cadence. Fael flees with the remaining dog slayers, only to be caught and killed by Sin. Sin rejoins the Ashok regiment and they ride to join the others in the rising Reriku. Pearl and Lestariel are together after burying Shaikh. 
They are on a high hill and look out at the adjunct's army, which has been positioned properly in the holy desert. A sea rises from the past. The basin will be flooded. Fiddler sits with his squad waiting for the sea, thinking the sound of its song is warm and comforting. Then two men step out to greet him, brothers, and they embrace. Hiborg, Scalara, and Felicin Younger look down from a ridge to the sea, only to learn about Lorik's fate from Iskarl Pust, who invites them to be guests. Cutter is alone and confused in the Temple of Shadow. Cotillion comes to find him. They speak together about Absalar, paths worth walking, and Felicin Elder's life. Cotillion says that soon Felicin Younger will come to the temple with others and then Cotillion charges Cutter with protecting the child. They speak a bit about balance, and then of love, and Cutter knows why Absalar had to leave. Karza Orlong then looks out across the new sea, pulls out the remains of Sibel. He speaks to her of her past, and then his own, saying once he believed in only glory, but he has learned that glory is nothing, which cannot be said for mercy. He throws her into the water and goes to ride west, hoping to be worthy to lead his brothers. I just wanted to point out, I think Steve's writing at the beginning of chapter 26 is really just like really strong. And he writes about this long passage about Felicin, and in it, it has the line, you know, Felicin's there and she's looking at Shaikh's armor and she says, she stood imprisoned in a stranger's armor, which I think is some terrific writing from Steve because not only is it calling upon some motifs he's written about with uh, Felicin before, but it's speaking about, I don't know, man, it's just getting to a lot of stuff. And I think mm-hmm. this opening here is doing a lot of work um, and it goes a long way in this chapter, I feel. I agree. I was waiting for one of them to say something, but Ditto. I agree. Yeah. I agree too. I like how um, when he was writing, like he'd call her Shaikh Felsen, but then yeah. at some points he would just call her Felsen, and at some mm-hmm. points he would just call her Shaikh, which I thought mm-hmm. was really interesting to describe. Like I don't know. I guess I, I feel when it was the Felsen parts, um, you can she just doesn't want to be there at all, and it's like this whole time we're thinking, or for a while I guess in the last book and the beginning of this book we're thinking like, well I was thinking she's free and you know. She's this powerful person now, when in reality, she just went from like one prison to another. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So y'all finally got your moment where uh, Shaikh is in Felsen now. How you feeling? Huh? Because in Dead House Gates, they were like, oh, where was the moment that Felsen became Shaikh? And now we uh, got it. Uh, <laughs> Here it is. How do you feel? I feel Whatever. I feel sad and unfulfilled. <laughs> same, same. So sad. Just say them. I feel empty. <laughs> let's let's touch on that in a second Lorik meets up with Karsa and they kind of make this plan and, and Karsa and they see kind of the slaughter and then Lorik goes to try and find Shaikh and Karsa speaks briefly with Leoman who's going to ride to join the others Leoman believes he can rally the rebellion but he needs to talk Shaikh into retreating and then Shaikh kind of emerges onto the battlefield Josh how did you feel about this whole sequence at this point? Did you really know where we were going? Um, I feel like I had... Hit, okay, so it was chapter... Here, here's my exact thought. It was chapter 26. And I was like, oh, okay, well, Shaik has to die. And my exact thought was there's too many characters in the Malazans that we haven't seen in a bit. So uh, we can't get to all of them in one chapter. So I guess Shaik needs to die this chapter. Uh, so, and, and when she walked out in the armor, it felt very, like, fatalistic, you know what I mean? Like, I was like, oh, okay, this is, this is how she died. Okay, I got it now. Um, that was kind of my thought on it. Uh, so you were feeling some doomed vibes. I don't know how you wouldn't be feeling doomed vibes. Even Leoman being like, we can rally. I was like, oh, duh, dude, you can just go, no, we're good. You can't. Just well, and then he sees her and it's like, oh shit, <laughs> and just <laughs> disappears. Yeah, oh my god, Lorik being, yeah, Lorik being like, I'm out! Whoosh, portal! Yeah. Was, uh, sorry, everything. Literally, he sees her and it's like, ah, fuck. That is, can I say, that's my dream superpower. Just mm-hmm. to just like walk into a situation and if I need to be like, ah, portal out. <laughs> 
So in the uh, Tavor hears about Shike descending down the hill and she she decides to meet the challenge and she puts on her own armor and goes to the basin. India, were you feeling similar doomed vibes? Where were you at before we actually got to the confrontation? I was not feeling doomed vibes. I don't know what I was expecting. I definitely wasn't expecting what actually happened. I thought that there would at least be some kind of like the like I expected there to be some recognition of any kind about anything between them. It was the whole point of Fellison's whole pissed off and like upset situation in the whole two books only for there to be nothing but her to kill her, not even know that she killed her. Yeah, that was rough. It pissed, felt I... pissed, fury, rage, anger is how I felt. I, I'm getting red just think I'm like sweating already. I literally was not expecting that at all. I'm sorry that I just jumped right into it. I it it, it was not at all what I, I literally read it like three times to be like, is it this this is what happened? But now I kind of get it now that we've been talking about it. I feel like it, it it's just like, wow. And you thought. But no, it was actually completely uneventful and nothing happened and Tavor is mm. going to go. I, I just makes, one, yeah. in one of these fucking books, she finds out that she not only sent her sister to be a slave, but then killed her. Uh, uh, listen, uh, uh, we're, we're, we've, since we're in it, I, I just want to say I, I, I think this ending, the ending, the ending in total doesn't really work for me, but this ending. Uh, this fellas in Tavor thing really does in a lot of ways. I think it's a great Fact. scene. People use the word tragic a lot to describe the fellas in story and what happens to her in this book. And I don't I really can't jive with that because to me, I think tragedy has to do with some sort of flaw that you are following and, and ultimately it consumes you. And I guess you could say the flaw of Felicin is that she just becomes obsessed with this vengeance of her sister or that she just can't let it go or something or I don't know. But I mean, Felicin was deeply wronged, you know, deeply, mm-hmm. deeply wronged. And Tavor, you know, d- has done nothing to face it at this time. I, and, I, and, and the idea that the problem of this finale was that Felicin was too upset at her sister. You know, I, I like I'm not saying she was in the right or anything, but <clears throat> I don't know. It, it just the idea that this is a tragic outcome for her. It, it like it's very sad, but I don't think it's tragic. And it, maybe I'm being pedantic, but Josh, I, I've had a lot of strong, disparaging words for Felicin. Um, <laughs> but I felt yeah, I felt indignant for her in this because I think it, I felt that it is unacceptable that Tavor does not have to reckon with what she has done. And I think that that reaction is probably exactly what Steve wanted. And in that sense, he's very successful here because I'm still mad that Tavor gets to walk away and eventually she'll get lied to or she gets told your sister died and she goes, hmm. And like, no, you murdered her. And I, I, if she does not reckon with that in later books, I will lose my mind. My, my point isn't necessarily even about Tavor. I think it's more about that there's, you know, at the beginning of it, uh, Felicin's like, man, look at these people, uh, this doomed conflict, you know, just violence on both sides that are wrong. And man, and then she goes and dies because I guess she's so consumed by this whole thing. And it doesn't really acknowledge for me that deep wrongness that she has been done and that the Empire is doing, you know, I'm not mm-hmm. saying that the the rebellion is morally correct in this violence or whatever but i mean tavor did send her sister to slavery and yeah i uh, i will be, i am indignant about that i have a question yes so when she does walk out do you think that she's still like in is she shy fully no. at that point <sighs> well, or do the, you think well, that she's like felison being like dragged out or is she felison like Oh, choosing well, to go out. Well, let's touch on that because mm. we, we were kind of building up to it, and then we really got si- we, we really jumped right into it. And sorry, sorry, Rage. no, you, it's a hot topic. So, Lauric, hot topic. 
we we see a little bit of the whirlwind goddess and then Loric goes in we learn more about the goddess herself and then we see uh Loric get attacked and corblo dom's talons ambush the whirlwind goddess and kill her so aj what did you make of this whole sequence and learning about the whirlwind goddess uh, I don't know. Uh, I wouldn't really. F- I don't feel like I would say learning about the whirlwind goddess is an accurate depiction of that scene, because it's just kind of like. I don't know. I, I I guess she says things like, "I stole her, my child." Blah blah blah. Um, and then her chains are breaking. Sure. But uh, I don't know. It's just kind of like yeah, we knew we knew Dryjna was like this. Uh, uh, I, I think we knew that the whirlwind goddess was like this chaotic being, right? Just kind mm-hmm. of hungering for literally the apocalypse. So I wouldn't really say I got a whole lot out of seeing her for like, I don't know, four paragraphs before she gets stabbed to death, you know? Yeah. Um, can, I, yeah. can I ask a question? Sure. Because I feel like there are ramifications to this scene that I sure. don't that I that I I have to know if this is just like a one off because because we know that Shaikh is the whirlwind goddess and I I feel like at some point we've se- it's been said that she is ascended am I incorrect in that I think you are incorrect in that I think and I do, see that I, was my I, and okay. I would never say Shaikh is the whirlwind goddess I would say she okay, was yeah. being, that's she, that's what I was trying to wrap my head around because she, I, I, I would her, say she was being possessed or maybe channeling okay. the divine presence of or something Be, like that because because we keep calling her goddess and saying that she's all powerful and it was very confusing because I I likened her to a Tillian to a shadow throne and what confused me is that she had a physical body do you know what i mean versus yeah. other ascendants it seems like they can choose to manifest physically or something and versus she had a very real very very mortal body that yeah. i was very taken aback by could just be like also just found and assassinated yeah, I think Shaikh was more of a vessel mm. for the whirlwind goddess. Certainly. Well, I get that, and but I'm talking about the the one that got killed in the Warren because I'm still kind of confused on that, like. Go ahead. I think that was the whirlwind goddess proper. Yeah. Right, and so the whirlwind goddess was really just I don't know. It just it it really felt strange to have a mortal body just kind of existing for that long that could be manifesting that power i don't know it threw me off it really because that made me wonder like do are there other people like powers that we've seen that like have a super secret body somewhere they could be killed i don't know well i don't know if i think the body her her like physical manifestation was like a new evolution of her or something because the whole time we're talking about or Lorik is talking about how she's going to take this part of Corald Emerlane. Mm-hmm. And every other time we talk about uh, the whirlwind goddess, it's just like she is Reriku. She is all around. And so I don't know if there actually was a physical body until she started taking that part of Corald Emerlane. Well, but she's a Talani mass. Yeah. Or was a Talani mass. So she started that's off as a right, body. That's right. That's right. That's right. See, that's what yeah, right? She was a Talani mass. Stuff. And we, we say she is Reriku. We say she is all these things. But really, it's just she's a, a Talani mass who... Man, took power and kind of was able to use power over a distance is that as simple as it was in the end yeah josh my reading's a little bit closer to that but i do want to take our attention back towards the scene on the hill where uh, the whirlwind goddess in presence kind of withdraws from Felicin here and i think in this scene steve's deliberately playing with the idea of a duel in this way mm-hmm. that that ends many books in this genre where these two commanders are going to come out and duel each other because they are heroes and villains and so they come out of mean of the hill and tavor stabs her sister through aj how did you feel about this scene uh i mean i, I think y'all already covered it but it was sad um, I forgot until I, I forgot that Tavor didn't know that it was Felicin until Pearl and the Star were like, "Hey, what's up?" And she's like, "Oh, what are you doing here? What's going on?" I sent yeah. you to say, I sent you to find Felicin. I forgot about that until until that part, yeah. uh, which just made it. It was like a gamut all over again. It was like, man, that stinks. And then it was like, oh man, that actually really stinks. 
so I, I, I don't really know what else I could add to it that you guys didn't already cover. It was very sad and I, f- I feel bad about it. It makes me sad when Fellison is like, why didn't you love me, sister? <gasps> oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. That whole inner Fellison, like we finally get to be in Fellison's head again for for like, you know, the first time in a while. And it's just like, oh, man, I remember uh, Ganos and and Tavor playing and it was going to be my turn soon. And then everything happened. And, and it's just and then the her it's just like talking about the weight of the armor and the weight of the sword and how everything is just like mm-hmm. pressing down on her. And she's like super aware of just, just super aware of everything again, yeah. you know, for the first time in God knows how long. Um, it's just really, that really is, it's a lot. It's a lot. And it's very, it's very heavy. It's very sad. Mm-hmm. I, I agree. I think it's a very sad story. Okay. Uh, I, I just, we don't have to keep this in the podcast, but I, I am now realizing in the chapter summary, uh, talking about the whirlwind goddesses, once husband's betrayal. Um, oh yeah. Do you want to loop it, back to that? Shouldn't we maybe, do that at the very I, I, end? No, well, it just, it, uh, here we can just cut it in if you want i don't know no it's fine if does it come up later because i think i just realized something that maybe was did did you not put it together i didn't no you didn't i no i didn't i no i did not put it together so that was why i didn't have a lot of feelings about it josh (laughs) did you put it together yeah. All right. So we're, All right, we're, well, then we're three, just talking about it when we get to it then. So we're three for what? Well, this is going. We this, should talk this, about it because this it is, is not no, explicitly said. So. AJ, AJ. Yeah, but it comes up later is, where they're like, oh, the, she's gone, dude. AJ, this is going in the show right now. Absolutely. This is <laughs> yeah. this is this is. I, Indy right. is doing a victory lap. So sure. Or have you yeah, put I, it together I, uh, right now in the span of this conversation? <laughs> yeah. So, OK, I guess to, to make it cleaner for me to edit. Uh, no, you know what? This is all just staying in. Yeah, so I didn't, I didn't get it. I didn't get the whirlwind goddess thing. What didn't you get? What didn't I you get? I didn't get that did? that she was Onrak's partner or whatever. Yeah. Which is funny because we all we all felt very high and mighty. We thought it was Kalava uh, mm. when we when he first talks about it. When in like the the episode on it, I think we're like, oh, it's got to be Kalava because yeah. she's the only bone caster who didn't become a a bone person. Mm. We did yeah. say well, that. No, he drew another woman. Yeah, that he, was why she was. He drew Kalava. Oh, drew Kalava. Yeah. Oh, right, right, right. And oh, this okay, is his good. wife. That's what it was. That's yeah. what it was. That's yeah. What it was. Thank you. Um. Yeah, I didn't get it, and now Classic I get it. Classic woman and scorned makes a whirlwind. Yeah, I really, I really have whole different feelings now about this one, the whole whirlwind goddess, and I understand why you asked me what my feelings were, Pete, because it does kind of suck. Mm-hmm. Uh. Um, yeah, I, I feel mixed about that, but. Um, so does this mean Onrax the bad guy? Well, it certainly puts a whole spin on his story, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Wow, I mean, damn. Onrak I guess I gotta direct- read the end of this book again. <laughs> Onrak is, di- is, is directly the cause of Felicin's death. Saying it now. I mean, I don't know if... There's dire- a lot I don't know weird- if directly is the word yeah. I would use. I say indirectly. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he certainly contributed to the events, but there's a lot of stuff that other people had to do yeah. to come to this point. Um... Okay. Like, people get cheated on and don't turn into <laughs> wrathful gods. It's the higher, thing. yeah. <laughs> That's true, I guess. <laughs> all right, well, n- now that all that gold just went into the show. Yeah, I don't know how I read over that. So. Damn. Leoman and Carson. still reeling from the gamut stuff, I guess. Leoman and Carsa <laughs> say their goodbyes. Josh, did you have any feelings about them saying goodbye? I want them to be better friends. Do you, you think know? they're friends? <sighs> I think that in another world they could be. I feel and like I wish they're they like were. I feel like they're like companions in a way. I don't know. Friends is a big word. Yeah, I think they could be friends in a different world, and I I wish that was the case. Um, but I was not shocked to see them go their own way, because I have a feeling that most people Carson spends time with he will kill yeah given given the right push so i like leoman and i would like him to not be just slaughtered by Carson. Mm. so so afterwards pearl and lestara come deliver corblo dom to adjunct tavor 
And then they decide to conceal what they know. And they say, oh, we found your sister, Felicin. She's dead. We know it for sure. And Tavor kind of accepts this and leaves. And they decide to bury Felicin's body. India, what did you think about their decision to conceal this information from Tavor? And do you think she will find out? Yeah, she'll find out, I think. If not, weird. But like, it could it could happen that way. I don't. I don't know why they decided to not tell her. So I, I, I don't, I just, I don't get it. You don't know why? No, nope. I don't, PB. Why don't you enlighten me? Well, AJ, do you think you know why? Sorry, I was just reading, the, <laughs> just reading the world and got a section again. <laughs> uh, what's going on? We're AJ, why we're talking didn't about they Carson tell Leoma. Tavor that, that she killed Felicin? Why didn't they? Yeah. Because it would have destroyed her. Are you kidding me? Yeah, it was it was an act of mercy. Yeah, Tavor the the the, the description of the Tavor? Uh, the cold Ugh. iron description of the way that Tavor uh, dispatches who she thinks is Shaikh is just like mm-hmm. sword goes in, uh, body falls, boot goes on chest to pull sword out, and Tavor walks away. Like that is brutal. And to to be like, oh, by the way, that was your younger mm-hmm. sister. This is your fault. You dumb bitch. Like, I I mean, certainly she should have to reckon with this in some way at some point. But I please, please, I do not think this was the moment. Mental state over the fact that she killed her sister. Is that what we're doing? (laughs) Just because. Okay, just because fellas. I said earlier that she should have been told she should have known. I don't know, guys. I I think just I I don't think it's fair to judge uh, to like. So when I don't, I don't think it's fair to be like, well, Felsen went through a whole lot of shit. Is so that the hill you're dying on? <laughs> AJ, I know what you're getting at, but like the news would upset her. Is that what you're saying? I th- it would d- destroy her. It's not a being upset. It's fucking she was she was upset when they were like, oh, hey, Gamut's dead. She would be like. I don't know, guys. I, I I am having a hard time agreeing with you here. The, I think the, she the, would. What the consequence? No mercy. The consequences of her actions would be difficult to deal with. Yeah, but I, I'm, God, I don't think now baby. is the moment to deal when with is this. The moment? After everything, after she's not f- actively leading an army. So and they're like, hey, <laughs> we lied. <laughs> That was your sister. <laughs> yeah. yeah there that's are a tougher conversation to have, I it's think. It's a tough I conversation really, to have no matter how do what, How you decide guys? the right moment? I see you're sitting, nice chicken Alfredo in front of you. Let me just real quick. Boop, boop, boop. <laughs> you killed your sister uh, with your with your sword. There's no good time. No, I'm not saying there is a good time. I'm just saying there's a better time than right this second, immediately after it happened, while she still has sure. to like okay. control I'll, an entire legion of people. I'll give you that. I, I'm kind of just playing it up for yucks in some ways, although I do sure. disagree with you, I will say. Whatever. <laughs> Um, I'm not saying it's not like a terrible thing that she did. I thought it was like, I thought, Peter, you were getting at like, maybe it was like something that Cotillion didn't want them to tell her. But if it's if it was just literally to spare her feelings, um, I I want no part. And I'm pissed. Mm -hmm. So uh, Fiddler's out with Cuddle and he's with Randall for a bit. They like encounter some desert warriors. They like Randall dies and it's kind of the end of Fiddler's story here. And it all ends with him kind of feeling the cadence of this song. And then he meets up with his two brothers and hugs them. Yes. Beautiful. How did you feel at the ending of Fiddler's story here? First off, I did not need them chasing into the. Uh, uh, okay. Yeah, that was weird. I'm going to say an unpopular opinion. If Fiddler pulled out a crossbow and shot Lieutenant Rannell in the back, I would have cheered at any moment in this book, which is a terrible thing to say. But watching this scene, all I could think is this fucking idiot is going to get Fiddler killed and everything was for nothing. And that was just so stressed about it the whole freaking time. And so and then he would like literally Fiddler was like, because this happened in the second book. They were like, you don't chase him into the whirlwind because they'll they, they'll fucking beat you in it. Mm. And it happened, and fucking Hedge saves him, and that was a nice moment, but I was also like, Fiddler, you are smarter than this. Mm. Stop listening to this big, dumb idiot. Uh, It was very frustrating to me. But the big hug at the end was very good, and I like that he got to see Hedge. I need, I want to go back, actually, and read book one, because that's the only time we get to see Fiddler and Hedge, and I feel like maybe, maybe there was more camaraderie there, or more, like, tit-for-tat than I remember, so... 
it, it was nice. India, where did you think about Fiddler's story in this book where it ended up in their kind of little hug at the end? Okay. So, you know, I'm not su- super invested in Fiddler um, or any of like the, I mean, it's complicated. I wasn't super moved, but I, I did like Fiddler kind of. I mean, his story wasn't terrible. It was like pretty good. So I'm happy that he didn't die. Um, I thought it was really nice. Did Hedge like ghost? Is he dead? He was like ghostly. He was like, hey, buddy. And he just like, <laughs> hey, he just like Ooh. hugged him a little, like, hey. held, like hid him so that Goodbye. he didn't die. Yeah, something like that. That was beautiful. I thought that was really <clears throat> cute and sweet. And um, I really liked that they all found that the, the boys, you know, found each other and hugged. So that was cute. It wasn't, I see, I mean, good ending. Good on you. <laughs> Good ending. I mean, I, I don't, I, there was no real anything that happened, but fair. So this is, we talked about it a bit earlier. We see the Tistliosian and there's like an explosion <laughs> and then, then, then the kind of four of them talk and they're like, all right, let's get out of here. So oh, you, you guys so were good. saying it was kind of comic relief. Why'd y'all feel that way? Oh, okay. So it's just like the, the, all the explosions go off and they, they, the Tistliosian get knocked off their horses or whatever. And they're like, no, you know what? I think it's not really their fault, you know, like it's it was really the dragon. So like maybe we should just, you know, maybe we should just let them kind of, you know, it's yeah. whatever, you know, it's not really that big of a breach. They didn't know the laws, you know, so yeah. I think we kind of got to ease up and maybe we just go. We go find the dragon. We figure we figure that out. Yeah, like <laughs> it's just the funniest shit. I read. So in this book. fucking so good. good. So good. I, I know exactly what you mean. It feels like when I'm talking to someone and we're just both talking ourselves out of doing something. <laughs> you know, I didn't, exactly, actually, I didn't really exactly. want to go to that bar anyway. You know, we should just yeah. stay. You know, I think, you know, there's no need to. Like, it wasn't their choice. It yeah, wasn't. They, they didn't do it on purpose. You they know, didn't, they didn't like, know the bylaw. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to say earlier on when, when we're going back and forth between like Korab and Fiddler and, and that stuff going back and forth. At, at one point, right before the uh, explosion goes off, Korab's final line before he presumably gets blown to bits. Spirits below. It is good to be alive. And then the next section is the detonation should have killed Fiddler, uh, which makes me think that Korab is now just blood dust like he's not <laughs> he has been exploded but his last thought was man it's good to be alive so I just thought that was funny we do put a pin on the whole sin the story as well sin we see the sin. ashok regiment <laughs> sin comes all the way back and she gets her vengeance and we put a pin in what i would call a, a c story for this book and uh, that's generous yeah i would say sin was mentioned in like chapter 12 and that was it <laughs> Well, she shows up in the finale with the Ashok Regiment, and India, you're giving mm-hmm. me a, 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 a completely nonplussed expression. <laughs> Who's Sin? Do you remember when Callum, Callum. Go, Kalam, Callum. Uh, he like is with that renegade people, and then they climb into the caves and stuff, and he, yeah, the mage that he worked with. The who mage was, who was like, poisoning the food. But didn't know that it would cause them to like die for oh, hours. Oh, and then yeah, she, they, they all bled everywhere and like yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Nope. That's yeah, that's exactly, her. exactly, exactly. The only the only reason I knew was because I just edited the episode where you talked about. We talked about it in episode four. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Oh my god. Like, yeah. No pee. No thoughts. So well, let her. me ask. Let me ask. Let me ask you about this then. So Pearl and Lestara, Yale, Barry, uh, Fellison, and and then the holy desert floods. So. You know, if you have any flood thoughts, share them. But I'd be more interested in what you think about this duo, um, which I do think stands in contrast to a lot of the other duos of the book, ser- books thus far. And I wonder what you make of Pearl and Lestar at Yill after House of Chains. So I love them together. I think mm-hmm. they're very funny. But um, and I and I clearly misread them the entire time because, like, here I am thinking that Pearl is going to double cross the star and he's just like this bad guy when in reality he's just like a sweet little guy mm. um ish kind of if anything he's, he's, he's the naive one Lestara. and then i thought okay well the is like clearly all business and not interested but then she's like you better come back or i'll come find you and i was like <laughs> oh. 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 so um i hope that they're in the next couple of books doing whatever i i will never not enjoy them 
I think that they could literally just be like pointless characters doing nothing, kind of like so many in this book. And I would still be happy reading what they were doing. I love them. Hmm. Josh? I'd love to give some flood thoughts, um, but I'm going to have to take us into the Steven Erickson is a weeb corner real quick. House of Chains was released in 2002. Oh my God. From 2000 to 2002, the One Piece manga, and I am currently rewatching One Piece, <laughs> has an arc called the Alabasta Arc in which... The Straw Hat Pirates do fight in a desert against a man who controls and creates sandstorms. And at the end of the arc, suddenly rain erupts into this desert that has been drought stricken for years. And I read this and I just finished the arc for, for uh, the, like, a, like three days before finishing this book. And Steven Erickson stole from One Piece. You've heard it here first. He is like, the biggest weeb. Listen, that's my. Um, if, thank you. if only there was some sort of venue where we could bring these questions to Steve Call directly. <laughs> oh Fuck. my gosh! <laughs> yes. Wow. So, wow. what does a flood relate? Like, what do you got? Wait, no. And I'm actually interested in why you asked about flood related questions. AJ, can you tell me if you have any flood related uh, thoughts? Uh, I was flood. Conf- I was confused by we were talking about a sandstorm and then I felt like all of a sudden it was like, no, there's an actual storm. We're flooding. And then we were back in the sandstorm. I was very confused there, but I did get that it was flooding and I didn't realize when it started. It just kind of was like, oh, now it's full of water. Uh, yeah, because Lestar and Pearl are like, oh, cool. Yeah, here comes the water. We're going to make it, but we'll make it on this island. And, and Lestar is like, well, now what do we do when we're on an island? And then but but before that, I did not realize that the desert was flooding. Well, that was when it started, I think. I think they were the first ones to talk about it. But it was just, okay, well then why weren't they like, hey, the fucking desert's flooding? They were just like, ah, yes, the desert, it is flooding, and we will be stuck on an island. Like, dude, what? Dude, the shit they've gone through, Lestora has had multiple conversations with That the, with I thought was actually really sex. interesting. I, I actually thought it was really interesting because there is a part where Lestora is like reflecting on all the stuff she's been through, and in that moment, mm-hmm. it was just like, very much a, a reader surrogate mm. uh, where yeah. it was like, man, all this shit happened, but I still have to think about this thing. So I can't even think about the weird bone dragon I saw crucified. I'm busy thinking about like <laughs> something yeah, yeah, else. Yeah. Like, uh, I don't know. I just thought that was really, uh, that was just really interesting. I agree. I do think it's purposeful there. Um, Havoric and co look out on the, fl- this flooding here. And then a Pust shows up and he says, they're all going to head <laughs> off together. On it's a, a big fucking... journey. So, India. You know, pust or bust, dude. Pust or bust. <laughs> there it is. There it is. Um, <laughs> are you pust or are you bust? Bust. <laughs> I can't stand him. <laughs> Josh, he's pust. He's so annoying. Pust or bust? Bust. I literally love when Cutter Crocus is like makes him feel bad and stuff. I, it's like it gives me life. Oh, I love yeah. it so much. The part where he's like, no, she's not even looking for you, dudes. You're not important to her at all. She's happier when you're not here. And he just gets pissed and leaves. I was like, yes, so good. that's what I need. Haters be damned. I love to pust a nut. And I love Fuck everything you. about that character. I quit, I quit this le- podcast. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Done. This is real. We're over. <laughs> Fuck these books. Goodbye. <laughs> I'm but <laughs> coming to this part, are we going to talk about the uh, uh, Crocus Cotillion thing that yeah, happened? So here, no? let, yeah, I, w- I really just wanted to get that bad joke out. And now, oh, yeah. well, let, Pete, did you see that somebody somebody called us the four Pusketeers? I did see oh, that. No. Yeah, oh, very no. good stuff. Very the good podcast stuff. has been so long. What was Josh's really funny joke he wanted to add into the show? <laughs> oh, Corvo <Kobo> Sub. <laughs> That's what it was. <laughs> Oh my god. Um, So, India, as you said at the end of this book, Cutter and Cotillion then have a whole conversation. And in some way, it kind of mirrors the conversation Cotillion had with Absalar back a few chapters ago. Mm -hmm. And Cutter speaks about his future and his love, and eventually, Cotillion's like, uh, charges him with protecting Felis and Younger. So what did you make of this conversation with Cutter? Cotillion is turning out to be quite the little matchmaker among uh, these young. <laughs> yeah, right? right? <laughs> okay, Cupid, more like, okay, Cotillion. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. But, All right, um, now, now I'm going to go. <laughs> I have a question. Yeah. <laughs> All right. He, he's, got so, he got, he's got so many fingers in the pie, and also he's playing matchmaker. Yeah. Literally. When okay. he talked to Absalar. Mm. Absalom was like, I don't want you to hurt him. La di da. Yeah. So then he and then left. Do we there's no other story other than that. Is there do we know what was going to happen? Was he going to like go like 
is do I know no, why she it, left? It's unknown no? her destination. Great. Um. Okay. Well, in that case, I felt really bad for him. He just. He was so sad when he realized she left and I just I don't know where she went and I don't know why. But it seems like Italian was like, you either got to leave or like something's happening to this kid. Right. Is, am I wrong? Mm-hmm. And then so she had to like leave to like save him. Yeah, yeah pretty much. Fiction. Yeah, it wasn't like a specific thing that was going to happen to him. But he, but it was just like if she and didn't did, leave, Crocus or Cutter would keep, you know, doing Cutter. Well, yes, your read on him is correct. Inge. Great. Stupid. Um, But I don't know. I just feel like. I don't know what's going on with them. I'm happy that he has a new crew now and he can like yeah. find a new girlfriend, fellas and younger. Good for him. Wow. I don't. Well, th- what is the point of this? Protect her from what? Like what's happening? I don't even know what's happening. Batillion is doing so much right now and explaining nothing. So yeah, they're, they're going somewhere, but yeah, w- where it is, who knows? I think so, c- there's, I think there's something really clever. C- c- Cutter makes some sort of joke. He's like, oh, how epic or something. Yeah, how yeah. epic of you. I think it's a very <laughs> purposeful gag. So. Oh, yeah. At the very end, then, uh, Karsa talks to Sabella briefly, throws her uh, the remains of her into the water, and mm-hmm. uh, rides west. So we're going to have a lot of opportunity to talk about Karsa, so we don't necessarily go fully into depth, but Josh, how did you feel about where this book leaves Karsa Orlong? Um, ah, wow, I didn't expect that question. I feel like most of our characters have completed a journey, you know, mm-hmm. of some sort. It, typically in each of these books, they make a journey. I feel like Karsa is like purposefully his 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 journey does not reach an end you know we've just gotten to this next part of it and i feel like he has the i have the clearest vision of like what he is going to do you know what i mean like he's going to keep perfecting himself until he can go lead the tablor into fucking whatever um i don't know uh it's a tough question <laughs> yeah well we're, we're gonna have a kind of episode in the off season kind of about Carson in a way, but and we'll also have a chance to talk about it in the mailbag, but I'll just share my thoughts. I find I'm not a Carsa fan and I find this ending very aggravating. He, you know, he has this line about mercy and I suppose mm, yeah, the yeah. I suppose the book here is trying to say Carsa has learned the value of mercy through his journey which I do not follow at all, and it has completely left me out of this House of Chains. Uh, I feel like he has shown that he understands that it can be appropriate to have mercy, but fully believes that it is not what everyone needs or deserves. That is how I, that's how I took it. <sighs> hmm. India, how do you feel about the ending of Karsa's journey in this book? I don't really see an ending as much as like an open-ended mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, story. Yeah. So I don't really, I, I'm, I'm just wondering like what's next for him because there really was no ending. Yes. I like that he threw that lady in the water though. That was nice of him. Mm-hmm. One of his chains gone. Well, AJ, before we do kind of big picture thoughts about the ending, do you want to say, do you have anything to say about Karsa's? Um, I don't really have anything to say about Karsa. <laughs> Pretty much, but the except for his or his, you know, his moment, obviously, the glory is nothing. And then he goes on to say the same cannot be said for mercy. And I think it's more a comment on the whole book, because like all of these, all the different players were chasing this glory. Right. And none of them get it. Uh, And even Tavor, who kind of gets it because she kills Shaink, Right. Like that isn't even really glory, so to speak. Um, you know, uh, I, I, it's I, a, I a facsimile of such, right? Yeah, and I, I don't know. I think the quote or that that line is more there f- to have us. It is the thesis of the book, I think, mm-hmm. um, in in a way, and is less about Carso or Long because I at this point, I I, I think I'm just I'm kind of with y'all. It's just like sure he's going to go on and do some more stuff, and maybe he'll come back in a later book, but you know his his story in this book is done and that quote at the end doesn't really i don't know he i I don't think he's really he understands these things but he hasn't put it into practice yet right it's just like he understands these things in the hindsight of all the stuff that just happened he's like oh yeah glory stinks i don't know i mean i know what you're saying about it speaking to how you feel about the rest of the book i just don't think Mm -hmm. he's the right vessel for that message for me but 
let's turn now to the entirety of the ending and then we'll briefly touch on the epilogue josh Mm -hmm. how do you feel like this whole book wraps up i do not think it wraps up anywhere near as neatly as memories of ice but i think that's a pretty high bar if i'm being (laughs) honest so i'll say that oh god i don't like the way it wraps up makes me wonder when i'll see these characters again do you know what i mean yeah because it's very like like everyone is in very disparate locations or not everyone there's there's some groups in very just disparate locations and especially the ones in Reriku, i feel like there are 27 more steps before they are out of seven cities unless like quick especially the armies you know what i mean not necessarily some individuals like quick band and kalam and fiddler could just escape whenever although i don't think fiddler will leave his troops anymore but um I don't know. I'm very curious to see where, like, how they get to the next spot and where the next spot even is. India, how do you feel House of Chains wraps up? I don't feel like it wrapped up very well. <laughs> it was more like a gift bag, you know? It was like, here, this is a few things that are closed now, but also there's a whole bunch of shit that's open and um, who knows what's next? Have fun. So I don't really think it wrapped up well. I But... I will say now I think they're like building on some things and and we're learning more things. So it, I don't think we necessarily were going to wrap up in this. All of the new open topics that we have, I feel like there's going to be a much yeah. hopefully more interesting book that will wrap up some of the things that we actually just discovered in this one. I know what you mean, that it's kind of building towards some other things. Yeah. And because Memories of Ice just seemed like a wrap up of things that we're building and then some new topics. And now I just feel like this was kind of starting over in some ways or just building on other things. AJ, brief thoughts about how this book wraps up all together. I mean, ultimately, I think I was satisfied that there wasn't some big battle Mm -hmm. Uh, because as I've been saying throughout the entire book, I was not interested in the prospect of like there being this huge battle at the end and one of the Tavor sisters or one of the parent sisters sisters coming out on top. Like I was never interested in that. Uh, And so I think the end of this book is, you know, I kind of got what I wished for, where it was just like all these little stories coming together. Uh, You know, everybody kind of had their own little moment and stuff. But I do think it's having only read Memories of Ice and having that extremely fulfilling and like nice tight bow wrapped, like felt really great at the end of that book. Um, I am feeling a bit unfulfilled, I suppose, Um, because a lot of the stuff, a lot of the ending stuff here is kind of non-ending right it's like non-ending stuff it is just like and now they are done they have done this and then and and i feel like we're gonna pick up on all of this stuff in a later book and it's just like steve was like well i don't want to write a 2000 page book so i'll just write the beginning of it (laughs) here and then (laughs) we'll pick it up later i love Um, that so and I as think if, I, as I, if Steve cares about how many pages his book are. <laughs> I think what you're touching on is a bit true. I think the book is definitely purposefully anticlimactic in a way, or it's trying to take a swerve or play with your expectations in the finale. But for me, glory I, is nothing. But for me, glory I don't. Is nothing. Gl- yes, glory is nothing. Glory is nothing. But for me, I don't think it at uh, it, it. That doesn't mean it sticks the landing. Because <laughs> to me, I. I'm pretty cold on this book, and we'll get to that more in the wrap-up show, I suppose, but I think reading the second half of this book has been particularly disappointing for me, and Mm. I think, although there are some parts of this book that jive for me, I think ultimately at the end, I can't help but feeling like... I don't even know why we did any of this. You know, I feel like completely adrift at the end of a book, at the end of House of Chains. So that's that's about where I'm at with reading this finale. Yeah, I agree. However, that brings us to the epilogue where oh, right. AJ, you Shit. brought up you brought up this glory comment earlier. But what I glory would like comment? this no glory is ah, it was a joke. I know what glory comment I'm talking about. I actually think there's more thesis being said. The ending here speaks more to me about what you're getting at, about that, you know, a lot of these characters are defined by their past traumas and they're being dragged around, so to speak. And 
Troll and Onrak certainly have their pasts they're dealing with. It's They talk mm-hmm. about them quite often. And finally, here in the epilogue, we, you know, we see Manal and we see all the, the these people and we're at the first throne. But Troll finally is going to talk about and face his past, you know, and I think yep. that speaks to me about how, you know, these th- these mistakes we've made in our past and these things that weigh us down, like we need to come to terms with and we need to face them. And that's how I feel. Yeah. We're going to we're going to have our off season, but we're going into it now. And I just thought it would be fun to tell the three of you at the end of this book. Oh, I already know. You already know. Oh, fuck. Yeah, I found the book in Barnes and Noble yesterday. (laughs) Nice. Well, so Inge, AJ, Josh, you know, the next book is the only character that is shared is Troll Sengar. (laughs) Yeah, that's and what I, I assumed. I assumed the entire book is about oh. trying to explain. Well, it's mm, the entire oh, book is that. about okay. the Tist Eater, Troll Sengar, <gasps> and <laughs> the story of how he ended up where he was that's in what House I of Change. Oh, that's I didn't what... get that though. <laughs> that is the most. That is the most oh, devastating man. thing. I'm gonna. I'm gonna stop good. recording. <laughs> Uh yeah. I gotta go. Fuck, that's so fu- I didn't I, get I, that. I, I like I mean, listen, and maybe that is somewhat spoilery, I guess, but I think no, I wanted to share that on the out. show and there's a lot going on in Midnight Tides, you know, so we're gonna have a lot to talk about. But that is where the story is going next to Troll Sungar, <laughs> the Tist Eater. That is the perfect direction for the story to go. <laughs> That's that exactly is, that where it's exactly pointing to. Us. I, <laughs> There's no story I happening I, in the present day. We need to go back. I like how could how could we tell a story in the present if we don't know the past? <laughs> Oh Every God. single character's past. I know, I know. I read the back of the book yesterday, and I did not get that it was in the past. I assumed we were going to be going to wherever they currently are. You know what Josh, I mean? Josh, that's foolish. Why Josh, would we continue why to follow? I know. Ever do I know. That? Come on. I know. How dare I? <laughs> oh man. Oh man. I'm so pissed. I'm <sighs> pissed. I'm pissed. I'm pissed. My least favorite character. It had to be his book. India, we've t- we talked about this yesterday. You don't hate the character. You just hate the, the way all, they the talk. Po- all the stuff that they're involved in. And so, like, you know what I'm going to say, though? You know what I'm going to say? I'm going to say, India? The they're involved in. <laughs> the, way, the way that troll talks, I imagine they are all going to talk well, that no. way. Don't I was going to, th- I think that it's going to be less of like, weird ethereal talk because they're going to be in that moment right unless they're still in, in they the past talk still like talking that? about the past all right all right hey does andamander rake typically talk real straightforward <laughs> Josh, yeah that's yeah. fair like yep. thousands of years ago andamander rakes walking around beer me bro what's good yeah. <laughs> We're not, that's not we get to see though <laughs> Oh, man. Well, all right. Listen, this episode was pretty hefty. She was thick. Thank you, everyone who went all the way through this extra long episode discussing the ending of House of Chains. We're going to have an off season with some special episodes like always. That episode that episode order will go up on our Twitter soon. And we'll have a mailbag episode, talk to Steve, and a few other things. Um, As always, you can let us know what you think of the show on Gmail or Twitter at 10 Very Big Books. And send us your mailbag comments and questions. Yeah, send us your comments. We want to hear from you going into the offseason. I think, especially with a book like House of Chains, that obviously the four of us have a lot of kind of different scattershot opinions about a lot of different parts. I'm really interested to hear from big fans of this book, big fans of Carcer, different parts of the uh, the story, to just bring in different perspectives on the show. So we look forward to hearing from everybody. And uh, thanks for listening. Hello, everyone. Producer AJ here. Realizing how long it's been since we recorded this episode. Uh, thank you so much for listening to this episode of the podcast. And not much to talk about in the credits this week, except the next episode of the show will be the House of Chains mailbag episode. And we want to hear from you. Uh, you can send us your questions, comments, thoughts, anything uh, about this book to either the mailbag channel in our Discord, or you can email it to us at 10 at gmail.com, or you can DM us on Twitter at 10 very big books. We will be recording 
recording the episode on October 4th, so you have until then to get us your message. Uh, the sooner, the better, though. Uh, if you'd like to send us a message on Discord, you can head on over to bit.ly slash VBB Discord and join everyone there. That's capital V, capital B, capital B, capital D, Discord. That link will also be in the show notes. If you'd like to check out our Patreon, you can visit the link in the show notes as well, uh, or you can head on over to patreon.com slash 10 very big books. At the time of this recording, we are now at 122 patrons and $477 a month, uh, which includes an extremely generous one-time donation from Adam. Uh, thank you so, so much. And thank you so, so much to anyone who has donated anything. Uh, I say this every time, but we really, really will never, ever be able to thank all of you enough. And as always, thank you so very much to Dan Gesserick for making our spectacular logo. You can follow him on Twitter at Dan Gesserick for tweets about not caring about last weekend's Eagles Rams game. And of course, the wonderful music in today's episode is by the one and only Amaranthan from their album Simulant Rain, which you can find along with their other music on Bandcamp.com. Links to their pages will be in the show notes and 10 Very Big Books will be back in two weeks on October 9th, talking about our final thoughts of House of Chains and answering your questions. Don't forget to send us your mailbag things. I will talk to you then and thank you so much for listening. Okay, hey, somewhere in this, can we, can I, can you just put in a clip of me being like Corbelo Dom, more like Corbelo Sub, because I really, like, I just, I just thought about that just now, and I'd like it to be put in somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, I'll use, I'll use that, unless you want to get a clean one. Unless you want to get a clean one. Uh, do you know what, do you want to do one, and we can all get a good laugh reaction in? <laughs> no, I think, I think we're good, I'd rather actually, there's nothing. How could you have not said that? All right, just I'll shoot, put that at just the shoot, end. just shoot that zinger somewhere in the podcast, Josh. Yeah. People are going to. I love it. <laughs> okay. That was incredible. <laughs>